What's up, Internet? My name is Jake Doxy, and welcome back to another episode of the Doxcast. I'm not going to lie, filming an intro is actually really, really fucking hard. After countless amount of efforts, I've realized this is probably the best we're going to get, so I'm not going to waste any more of my time, and for the length of the intro, I'm not going to waste any more of your time either. So without further ado, let's get straight into the episode. Try to catch a lie, yeah, I had to put her on. Bought her too skidded, yeah, we heading for the sun. Shot it, got my high, I ain't tripping for the fun. Yeah, I won't start, I ain't tripping, I'm a stun. Oh. So before we start, I need to say something to you that I say to everyone that comes on, but mm-hmm. I would not be saying it if it wasn't true. You're sitting here because I find you interesting, and that's because you are an interesting person. I want to learn more about you, how you think, and how you feel, and I love that I have the opportunity to share this experience. So I really appreciate you for coming over. Thank you for sitting down. Ladies and gentlemen, a man who is absolutely exceeding inside his competitive sport, an inspiring story of hard work and dedication that is being represented through medals and achievements inside of a martial art. A man that I've been excited to be sitting down with today, this is Joshua Saunders. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's How it, are we? Right? I would love to jump straight to some questions about BJJ. Please, yeah. But I thought I'd give me and the boys listening a little recap on yourself first. So, how old are you and whereabouts are you from? Uh, 25 years I've been here. Um, I don't know, depending on the weird esoterics of what you believe, I think I've been here before a couple times. So, <laughs> yeah, <jump> maybe <laughs> maybe not just 25 years, but... Um, 25 years in this embodiment. Right, I love this um, straight away. Yeah, yeah and uh, I'm from Western Sydney, so born mm-hmm. and bred, born in Westmead. Um, moved around a couple of times, but pretty much Western Sydney. Yeah, nice. Now, when you say a couple of times, like, you know, you, right now you live in West West. Mm-hmm. Have you always been that far or a bit more towards this uh, place? Always in around, like, the Hills District, Blacktown. Hills. Mm-hmm. Um Never Doonside. Doonside's a shithole. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in and around Penrith and stuff like that. Yeah, so pretty similar to me, actually. I grew up around um, St. Mary's. Lived to Penrith, then I've gone Rouse Hill, Quaggers Hill. Oh, nice. uh, jumped around a few times. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I've got some notes here because I had a pretty good list of shit I wanted to talk to you about today. Yeah, awesome. Then um, what about growing up? Like, uh, what were you interested in back then? Um, Pretty much the, the modus operandi of me growing up was rugby league. Like, okay. live, breathe, eat shit. Like, everything was about rugby. I remember, it's a funny story. Um, I was at my uncle's house in 2005 when the Tigers won the grand final. And I used to go for para when I was a young fella. And um, I remember crying my eyes out because para got fucking whooped by New- North <laughs> Queensland at 29 nil in the semifinals. But, like, that was how much it meant to me. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, from... from five six years old everything was about nrl okay everything was about making footy being a footy player all that sort of stuff and sometimes when you grow up you realize that your dreams are fucking stupid (laughs) um and it doesn't work out so i went all the way through like junior leagues i was like really good when i was a kid um and then as soon as it started to become a bit more serious with like representation i started to you know be a little bit harder on myself and measure myself against the outcomes and stuff like that and it kind of ruined the sport for me because it was all about improving mm-hmm. upon numbers rather than playing the sport and enjoying it for what it was yeah um ended up playing sg ball at north sydney bears um i got snubbed from every other team so i tried out for para tigers roosters cronulla and i think west and they all stunned me. Mm-hmm. I went to North Sydney Bears, and North Sydney Bears hold their trials at the end on purpose because it's all the rejects that go there. Like, okay. North Sydney Bears suck. They're, okay. they're just fucking rubbish. They're a great club. Mm-hmm. Um, Greg Florimo, the guy who's like the, the CEO guy, the chief there, he's a fucking lovely guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but their team's shit. Okay. And I went to the Fair trials, enough. scored two full field tries, come off the field, and I went up to the selectors that were in like the cubby thing on the side and they're like oh do we know if we made the second trial or not and he goes what number were you i was like green number 12 he goes nah, you don't have to come back you're in the team mate oh nice yeah nice. it was cool it was a really nice thing yeah, and um so i ended up playing the full season there we lost all our games <laughs> yeah. uh we just got bashed went yeah. to perth got bashed it's just it was fucking terrible um but i did enough to be able to get selected for the under 20 side in south sydney or like the tryouts for that they call it um this is actually where i stole my business name from hpu they call it high performance unit okay yeah that's where okay. it actually came from that, that was going to be one of my questions yeah well. so in the under 19s the bridge between sg ball and under 20s is called hpu oh. and I, th- I thought about it one day when i was starting business and i was like hpu sounds pretty good i'm gonna fucking knock that off because i don't do it anymore so no yeah. one to be able to tell the i've yeah. just outed myself now but no <laughs> yeah. one will be able to tell the difference but um yeah i was one of four selected to go over to under 20s um mm-hmm. in south sydney i was the only person who made the team Oh, okay. So I played under wow. 20s when I was 19 and I played 20s when I was 20 as well. So I played two years at Souths. Um, I then went into an NRL system at the Raiders. Mm-hmm. Um, got told I was no longer needed in the car park. 
mm-hmm. of a training session. Yeah. Um, basically told me to fuck off and take my things back to Sydney. Oh, oh I thought you were going to say the other way around. Like, you nah. know, needed in the car park. Yeah. Come like, onto the field, yeah. Came back into Sydney and um, played Mounties New South Wales Cup and um, whatever the fuck the underneath, it's escaping me now. Ron Massey. I was playing Ron Massey in Cup for a year uh, and then I basically decided to call it quits. And that was when I was 21. Um, two years later, started jiu-jitsu just at the end of the first lockdown in Sydney with all the COVID bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I've been doing that ever since. Yeah, nice. That's pretty cool. So you're pretty dedicated to league when it sounds like it. It yeah. was the only thing I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, it sounds that like it. That was it. Like I couldn't care less. Mm-hmm. I, I literally was getting paid from South Sydney $3,000 a year. Oh, shit. At 19 years old. Oh, wow. Like, I didn't even know you got paid to yeah, do that. Yeah. Like trying to do rent and everything else. You got to work. You got to work mm-hmm. or study 24 hours a week to be eligible for the team. Mm-hmm. Um, so you either go to uni for 24 hours or you work. Uh, I was working in a cafe in Redfern. Shout out Hunter's Corner if it's still a thing. Mm-hmm. I know the guy that used to own it when I was there. He's no longer there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you bust your ass and make it happen and see where you end up. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a pretty cool system, I guess, how they make you either study or work in order to be part of it. It's come a long way. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a lot of people who are just rugby league players and then they don't develop any ex- extracurricular skills mm-hmm. and they struggle because they go back to being a bricklayer or a scaffolder or something dumb Yeah, and they never progress. Yeah. They've got all this talent in the world, but then they never do anything with it. And by the way, shout out to the scaffies. I've got a couple of you boys listening. Mate. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Plenty of pollies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah, I love the scaffies. Nice. Um, I'm brand new to any type of sport. Eh? I've never played any competitive sport in my life. No team sport. Really? Competitive, different story, but team sport, none. Okay. None. I've always been interested in fighting, you know. I've done boxing, kickboxing, a little bit of Muay Thai, things like that. Just more of like a, a fitness thing. They didn't actually get that mm-hmm. in my first fight. COVID actually stopped that. Mm-hmm. But I was going to say, how many people go through what you went through and don't make it into the NRL that's on the TV? Oh, thousands. Thousands? Thousands. Yeah. There's only 500 plays in the NRL at any one time. Mm-hmm. And let's take Penrith, for example, Penrith Junior System. There's like 13,000 kids that play every year. Oh, shit. Yeah, across all grades. So oh, for wow. like under fours, under fives, sixes, all the way up to 18s, all the way up to A grade, there's fucking shitloads of kids. Shit. You're literally in the top 1% if yeah. you make the NRL. Like, it's very fucking difficult. Yeah. Like, I was quite good, mm-hmm. and I still didn't make it. Yeah. Uh, and that that's not a, a unique story whatsoever. There's hundreds of hundreds of kids that I could name that were so good in the under-20 system, and then they just fell off. They never got an NRL contract. They did an NRL preseason just like me, but then they never eventuated into anything. Um, and it's it's hard to tell who's going to make it. It really is because even I won't name who he is, but he was in my under twenties team, and he kind of was a bit shit. Yeah. He like gave up pretty often and and did all those sorts of things, and now he plays in the NRL. Okay, yeah. And what do you think that was a? Um, did he have someone on the inside trying to help him out? Or did he just pull his head in and maturity? I think I think okay. there's a maturity aspect, and I think if you give them a sniff, they start to change their tone. Okay. I think as soon as you start to realize that you're on the cusp you'll then start putting in the required effort, the requisite effort. Mm-hmm. Um, I know being in around people like Sam Burgess and Greg Inglis and all these guys, like you do start to take it a little bit more professionally. And it's funny, it's a bit of a juxtaposition between jiu-jitsu and rugby league is that it's much more of a developed sport. It's much more professional. There's physios, there's SNCs, there's all these guys, there's dietitians, nutritionists, all these things. And jiu-jitsu, it's kind of like the Wild West. Yeah. It's yeah, like, okay. let's see who can fucking train the most mm-hmm. and see what happens. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. Cool. That is interesting. I thought this would be a good podcast for me and my mates listening because we're not part of the jiu-jitsu community. We're only outsiders looking in. Okay, cool. My best mate is actually someone that you, I think you do know, Ryan Fossey. I think you call him q Yes, q yeah, 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 big QF. I wasn't even aware, um, but I'd actually seen you before because he invited me to a session at Western City Martial Arts where you train. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was the day he got appointed his blue belt, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, so yeah, it was yeah. a good experience for me to go and actually witness him do that because he's been my best mate. Shout out to you, Fossey. He's been my best mate for 20 years. He's a good kid. I like he, you, Fart. Yeah, he's a good yeah. kid. He's fallen off training, he told me recently. He Fucking told- rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely rubbish. I'm disappointed. Where's the camera? I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah. He told me that you were going to say something like that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. Um, but my, I was going to say, I thought it would be nice and educational for me and my mates listening. Mm-hmm as we're just outsiders looking in. But you're only um, a few years into it, you told you just told me. You started mm-hmm. just before lockdown. Mm-hmm. So how long is that? The first and three years? I started at the end of the first lockdown, the 24th of July um, in 2020. And the only reason I know that is because oh. it's the day I got my license back. 
Okay. That was the only thing stopping me from going to class. Obviously, you're fucking locked down, but mm -hmm. obviously, the, the only thing that was stopping me from working and being able to train was a license. Yeah. I couldn't get the bus. I couldn't work out the, the timetable. just wasn't feasible. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I got my license back. It's kind of fucking weird too because I had to do the outdoor testing where they didn't have like the RMS and stuff was open. It was actually oh. in Penrith. Okay. And now I spend a majority of my time in Penrith. It's kind of yeah. like a nice little, <laughs> nice little serendipitous thing. Yeah, yeah. So you lost your license prior to that? 52 months. 52 months? Mm -hmm. You lost it in, for, in a row. You lost it for uh, months. In succession, but it was from multiple different things. So I got Shit. done. Uh, the reason I actually don't drink alcohol anymore. I quit when I was 19. I'll be mm -hmm. seven years in May next year. Nice. Uh, it was because I got arrested drunk driving. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. fucking stupid. Don't do it. Don't get arrested. Don't yeah. get put in the fishbowl. It sucks. You'll yeah. cry. It's it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, yeah I just, so I, had, I have this- um, when I was younger, I had this like big disdain for authority. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me what to do. You like all that sort of stuff. And it's like, look, if I can physically drive a car, I can physically drive a car. It doesn't yeah. matter about the legality. Yeah. It's just fucking stupid teenager yeah. chat inside your own head. And it's like, I can do whatever I want. I'm invincible, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. You sort of get out of that when you get to like your 23s and 25s and stuff like that. Hopefully. I know a lot of guys haven't. They're fucking 32s. But yeah, um, yeah I started to relax that a little bit and realize that on a, I was on a one-way path. I actually was- Depending on where I got caught driving on that day, I could have been going to jail. Yeah, okay. So, it was a big turning point, um, thankfully. Like, a lot of people get to that stage and keep going, and then they end up in jail, they ruin their lives. Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those things where I had to make a decision whether I was going to continue the shitty behaviors that I was adopting or straighten my fucking self out. Yeah. And it, it's funny because everybody goes, oh, you didn't learn the first time. I was like, when the fuck was the first time you learned something the first time? Yeah. Like, you got to go through it yeah. a couple of times. You, don't, you haven't experienced enough pain. If you don't learn the lesson the first time, it's the exact same people with uh, weight loss, and they they finally get like a diabetes, um, a diabetes diagnosis, and then they go, oh fuck, maybe I got to do something about this. Yeah. But they ignored the thirty five other signs on the way there. Yeah. I was like, oh, I can't yeah. see my dick anymore. Yeah. Maybe that should have been a fuck enough pain for you. But um, <laughs> yeah, I've finally got to that stage where I was like, all right, well, you know, I can I can relax a little bit. Um, I don't have to have this fucking huge disdain for authority. And I still have it in some areas, but it obviously wasn't serving me too well. So I've brushed mm. that. Yeah, that's cool. And you're saying you're seven years without drinking now? So yeah, 29th right. of May next year will be seven years. Yeah, well, it, um, I, I think that's fucking mad, bro. I just started uh, sobriety myself, actually. I'm I think nice. maybe three months in or something like that. I nice. haven't had a massive problem, you know, in the last couple of years with drinking or mm -hmm. drugs or anything like that. For me, it was actually to get off gambling. It was okay. the easiest way to get off it. Okay. So I respect seven years. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Did it get easier for as your time went on or was it um, always easy? I have like a special type of autism where if I decide I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I never go back. Yeah. I, ne I never go back on my word. Not never. I have in the past. Um, but I do my very best to never go back on what I say. Mm -hmm. And I think if people are listening to this and they gain anything from this podcast, the whole like do what you say, say what you do thing I'm so hard on is because if you do what you say and say what you do more often than you don't, you build self-trust in yourself. And then you can start to use that to your advantage because if you trust what you say, you'll follow through with it. So yeah. now you're not saying things you don't follow through with. Mm -hmm. And I had a, it's a cool little example of this i was talking shit on podcasts six months before i won the ticket to the world titles recently uh saying when i win not if yeah i refuse to believe if mm -hmm. i was going to say i'm going to put the work in i'm going to call this out like six yeah. months in advance i'm going to fucking do it yeah well, and then end up happening yeah cool so it's one of those things where if you can do that on a small scale every single day you say look i'm not going to eat this bag of chocolate mm -hmm. for dinner mm -hmm. i'm going to yeah. eat it on the weekend only once on the weekend if you stick to that that represents to yourself that you can Okay. If you can do that, then you can start to extrapolate it to bigger tasks in your life, like saying, I'm going to save 50 grand mm. or uh, I'm going to lose 15 kilos or anything like that. Like they're higher order tasks. The only way you get to higher order tasks, if you nail the little things, yeah. if you don't nail the little things, there's too many fucking holes in the boat. Like you can yeah. have the biggest bucket in the world trying to yeah. throw water overboard, but there's, you're in a sinking ship. Yeah. It's never going to work. I like the way you said that because um, I'm trying to do that at the moment. You know what I mean? And that's why I'm only early into the whole sobriety thing and mm. other things along the way. But I like the way you said uh, you have a small bit of autism. I think I can relate to that as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I can definitely relate to there's that There's only well. one way you get really good at jiu-jitsu and it's if you're autistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, okay. that's, there's only one way. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Right, we'll circle back into jiu-jitsu for a sec. So you're... You know, you haven't been doing it for really not that long at all. You yeah, just really over been. two years. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's pretty crazy because you're a what? What a ranking are you right now? Brown belt, which is the second highest. Second highest, I thought so. Yeah, I thought so. So 
Can you explain to me and everyone else like what you need to get before you get a brown belt and how long does it typically typically take to get all of these belts? So the ranks are all the way from the bottom, um, excluding kids' belts, because I actually don't know the order of the kids' belts. I never did jiu yeah. as a kid, so I have no okay. idea. I know there's green, orange, yellow, and white, mm-hmm. and gray, and then gray with white, orange with- Oh, this fucking whole system. I don't know. It. Mm-hmm. Um, so in adults' jiu-jitsu, there's white belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belt. Mm-hmm. Now, typically, white to blue should take you about 12 months. Yeah. Blue to purple should take you about two to three-ish years. Um, brown should take you eight years, and then black should take you about 10. Oh. Typically, that's that's the, like the standardization of history of the system, yeah. and some schools run it that way. Some schools say you can't have a blue belt until you've been doing it a year, or you can't do it until you've been showing up to three lessons a week for a year, and there's some- I very, found very, a little bit like um, like a pyramid grabbing, scheme. You know what I mean? Like a bit yeah. more like a incl- inclination to keep paying money to go. Yeah. yeah, it's unfortunately some schools are like that. It's like, well, if you show up to this many lessons and you give us this much money, we'll give you a belt. And it's okay. like there's no validity in the belt. Yeah. Like I was, I was versing these type of guys at white belt and beating the fuck out of them in their purple belts. And it's oh, like, okay. well, are you? Because you're not. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, so it should take you x amount of years per belt. Um. And I've done it in a quarter of the time. Yeah, fuck. That's impressive. And that's uh, stereotypically how long it takes. Like, on average, is it quite often? Like, how often do people exceed that time frame? It's getting more and more um, frequent, more and more common as the sport starts to develop. Um, there's a lot more money in the sport than there was 10, 15 years ago, and even more so than there was 10, 15 years before that. Um, it's the same thing with, like, the NRL. They're getting bigger salary caps and stuff like that. So there's a lot more... Uh, interested young talent of people who would otherwise be playing soccer or rugby or anything like that. They're starting to now migrate. We're starting to see that in the sport. It's really cool. Um, so that's that's probably one of the main reasons as to why the kids are getting so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's becoming more popular. The rise of the UFC in the last 20 years, um, Bellator, all the other MMA organizations. You're seeing these people do this crazy fucking butt scooting shit on the ground. You're like, what is that? Yeah. And then you hear all this yeah. stuff about how karate is bullshit. And then you're like, mm-hmm. oh, well, maybe I'll try this jujitsu stuff. So it's getting more popular. It's getting more traction, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and with that, you start to get elite people you start to get hyper elite genetic freaks like myself yeah. um that were doing other sports at a professional level and i had this conversation with a black belt at my gym all the time his name is jeremy skinner he was actually the uh the second person from our team to make the world titles in vegas mm-hmm. not long ago in september mm-hmm. and i said to him i was like um it's, it's interesting to see people like yourself because he's very articulate he's very uh, a thinking man rather than an athlete like if you put okay. him into tennis he'd be fucking woeful yeah okay. like that's not to say that if i did tennis i'd be good i'm shit at hand-eye coordination sports but if i use my body for a weapon in rugby or mm. afl or union all other sports i've played i tend to be fucking really good yeah and that comes with it a certain amount of attributes, whether you can move left to right, whether you can jump high, whether you can sprint fast. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think Jeremy could run 100 meters even, <laughs> let yeah. alone sprint it. Yeah. Um, and we're now starting to see the transition of athletes coming to the sport. You've got people like myself, people like Nicky Rod, um, very explosive, fast, dominant people. And now they're learning technique as well. Yeah. If you put those two things together, everybody else is fucked. Yeah, okay. So we're starting to see that just creep in. And mm-hmm. I think that's why people are getting so much better so much quicker yeah. is because now there's more benefit to the sport there's more eyes on it you can make a lot more money off it now it's more viable to live off whereas 10 years ago you'd have to try and make the nfl you'd have to try and make the nba or the nrl or Mm. the afl or something like that it's just not the case anymore yeah yeah cool and what do you think has pushed you above the average student in the ability to smash it out with way quicker time um to answer that question in supreme detail, I actually built a course around that. It's, okay. it's on uh, now. I basically run it off TikTok to answer all the questions that would be coming from this. Yeah. Um, the kind of like joking, sarcastic answer I say is cunt. Just pure <laughs> cunt. Yeah. Uh, I was actually yeah. on another podcast with a mate of mine from um, Adelaide. They come up and interviewed me and they did a similar thing. And they said, he goes, so you're a purple belt now. He's like, yeah, how long did that take you? I was like 19 months. And he goes, how the fuck is that even possible? I just looked him dead in the face. I said, pure cunt. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I just, I never listened to anything that said that I couldn't. Yeah. Right. And I, I started in my first gym at um, in Borkham Hills, just down the road from here. And there was a guy called Kit Dale. He's famous for getting his black belt in four years. It's pretty quick. He's, I think he's the third or fourth fastest person to ever do it. Wow. Um, and Is that I, worldwide or Australia wide? He's from Australia. Yeah. Yeah, he's from Australia. Um, the fastest person to ever do it is BJ Penn. He fought in the UFC at lightweight. Uh, actually, I think he fought featherweight, lightweight, and middleweight. He's a bit of a freak. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hawaiian dude, really nice guy. 
anyway, um, I asked my coach and I said to him, I was like, do you reckon you can do that again in four years? And he goes, yeah, why not? <laughs> and I yeah. think if at that moment, the level of authority that I was giving him as a white belt, um, now, like, he's a great dude, don't get me wrong, but he's not a black belt. Mm -hmm. Like, he just does one move, one technique, and then that's it, and he doesn't teach things that are great. Uh, it's not to take away anything from the person, but the level that, of which I understand jiu-jitsu now, he's probably like a purple belt or something like that. And again, that's not to take anything away from him. That's just yeah. the skill level and how far the sport has progressed. Yeah. If you make it to black belt and you kind of coast, I think it should be allowed to be taken off you. Mm. You just coast on the things that got you there. It's like it's the same thing as why people yo-yo diet, right? They lose 10 kilos and then they gain it back. Why? Because they stopped doing the necessary actions that they were meant to be doing mm. to continue to keep that weight off. Yeah. They were just outcome focused. Yeah. And if you only focus on the outcome, that's all you're going to get. You're yeah, not going to get yeah. sustained results after that. Mm -hmm. It's like the same thing with sobriety. If you go like, I'm going to stay sober for six months, as soon as it hits six months, fuck that itch is going to come back real quick. Yeah. And then you're going to concede and then you go, go fuck, I've got to do six months again. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, but yeah, I think at that moment, if he would have said, oh, you know, it's a little bit difficult because of this, this, this reason, maybe that would have disheartened me. Maybe it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that there was nothing in front of me that said that I couldn't and all my mates were telling me like, man, you're going to be really good at this because you're fucking us up and we've all been training for six months. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I just never said no and continued to do the sport more and more and more. And um, it's actually a cool story. I've told this on another on another podcast. I went into the gym that I train at now at Penrith and um, the He's basically, we're basically at the time is the best blue belt in the country, like winning all the comps, submitting everybody. And um, he'll fucking hate me if I don't say it. He ended up submitting me at the end of the round, but I put a fucking bit of a whooping on him yeah. for what a white belt should have, yeah. right? There was a very low expectation of what I was capable of and a very high expectation of his, and the roles kind of reversed. Okay. And uh, I went over to my coach now, Luke Martin, at the desk, and I was like, can I sign up? He goes, yeah, but where the fuck have you come from? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He goes, where, where the fuck have you been? I haven't heard of you. I have no idea who you are. And you just put a fucking beating on that guy. And he's one of our best students. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I've been training for like six, seven months, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, no, seriously, how long have you been training? I was like, no, I started in like July last year. And he goes, what the fuck? <laughs> it didn't make sense. He said to me that day, he goes, if you make, if you train here for 12 months, you'll make trials and you win trials. Okay. I was like, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then I just never took anyone's word else for it. And I just continued to go. And then 18 months later, because of the lockdown and then the things got pushed backwards, I did mm -hmm. win trials. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, if you listen to the people who are ahead of you have authority, mm -hmm. um, you don't take no for an answer and you just keep working and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if you commit yourself long enough, it doesn't matter on a long enough time horizon. Um, the outcome becomes inevitable, basically. Yeah. And that is a great recount to when you said um, you're building trust in yourself. And because you're able to do that so many times in the past, mm -hmm. it was very easy to convince yourself you're going to do it. Absolutely. Did you have many people in your way as a barrier telling you it's not too possible or, you know, you're trying to do things too quickly, anything like that? Um, I've gathered some of that towards the tail end, but I've always, I, I already have a fucking mountain of evidence that I can. Mm -hmm. Like people on TikTok, they're like, oh, you fucking fake brown belt. And I was like, all right, come, come to my gym for 30 seconds and you'll yeah. find out. Yeah. And it's just, it's just one of those things. You just don't listen to those sorts of people because they're not educated on the subject. They have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, one guy actually said to me, like, you guys don't know anything about jiu-jitsu listening to this podcast, but one guy actually said to me that mount uh, guard is like bottom mount or reverse mount or some shit, and it's like completely not true. Okay. And it's fucking retarded. <laughs> like, mount is a is a completely different position to upside down guard or whatever the fuck he was trying to tell me. Yeah. But this is the level of intellect. You know when people say, oh, I watch UFC, bro, watch out, like I train UFC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, like- yeah. Uh, yeah, what, are you, what, you what are you talking about? You just you just turn away and you're like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's beside the point. Mm -hmm. but, uh, inside of BJJ, who do you look at for like your real role models and inspiration? I don't really necessarily agree with like having role models per se. I, I like to model myself off people, whether that's semantics on the definition of role models or not. Um, I like a lot of the qualities from a lot of the athletes in terms of, I don't look at them as people per se because I don't think necessarily that every, anybody is special. I know at the start you said I'm interesting and that's why I'm here, um, which is, yeah, it is weird to me. Like people always tell me they're like, I love the way you think. And it's just weird for me because it's just the way that I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely a curious person, but like, yeah. I'm interested in when people have a passion or something like that. That definitely interests yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's why I built my business, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like I was so fascinated with studying people who are high performers in every different aspect of life. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're the best fisherman in the world, the best garbo, like, the, the mm -hmm. best scaffold I, I don't care I want to know what makes you fucking tick mm -hmm. because why have you decided to put a disproportionate amount of effort into getting better at this seemingly fucking retarded thing yeah 
ergo jujitsu. Yeah, like yeah, jujitsu yeah, yeah. to the outside person is fucking sweaty ground hugging with men, yeah. and it looks yeah. gay as fuck. And yeah, it's, it's like, well, just about to chuck that in there. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's yeah. not. It's not like gay if I can break your limbs. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's one of those things. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I look to a lot of the qualities of high level athletes in all sports because I don't think you necessarily have to absolve yourself with just people in jujitsu. I mean. I look to them for their technical prowess, but I also look to the mindsets of people like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Tom Brady, all these sorts of high-level performers, mm-hmm. even people in the business world. Um, not Gary V. Fuck Gary V. Um, <laughs> I don't mean like that. People always say fuck that. Fuck Gary V. Like He's a Gary homo. V. He's a fucking Gary homo. Um, Makes me laugh a lot. People like Alex Hormozzi, very, very good at what they do. Grant Cardone, to a point, is a very good at what he does. Uh, Lewis Howes is very good at what he does. Like all these podcast hosts, Joe Rogan's another one of those people. Jocko Willink, who was I. Like, I was fortunate enough to meet in oh, Vegas, which oh, was really oh, cool. Yeah, I was going to ask you that too. Yeah. Fucking nice dude, hey. Yeah. Really nice dude. That's cool. And like gave me all the time of day. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he was literally on his way and I turned. I was like, holy shit, it's Jocko. Yeah, yeah. I said, dude, what's going on? And he's like, oh, nothing, man. Like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, thanks for um, sponsoring the event because they gave us like the Jocko protein shakes and the energy drinks for free in oh, the wow. athlete's room. Mm-hmm. So he sponsored the event. He just gave us a shit ton of cases of stuff. And I was like, I appreciate wow. it, man. Like, it's really cool. Like, it's it's helped during the day and he goes oh I'm glad you like it blah 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 blah. he's like where are you from and all that sort of stuff he's a really lovely guy yeah that's awesome yeah, yeah. really nice guy but um, to answer you, to go back to answer your question I look at the characteristics of mindset from a lot of different people um, within BJJ specifically or Jiu Jitsu specifically uh, I looked at people like Gordon Ryan the people at the top um, Giancarlo Bardoni um, people like Craig Jones who have excelled from Australia it's really cool to see the pathway that he's kind of been the first guy that opened up that doorway for us which is really cool mm-hmm. um, people like Lockheed and Giles from Australia as well. It's cool to see like homegrown people that have just picked up the sport, done it for long enough and mm-hmm. succeeded on the world stage. Yeah. And it kind of gives me reminders that I can do the same thing. Yeah. Um, not that I necessarily need that, but it's nice I to have confluence. Said reminder. That was cool. Yeah it's, yeah. it's nice to have confluence that you're in the right path and it's, it is doable. It's kind of like the four minute mile with Roger Bannister. He was the first guy to run a four minute mile. And back then, whenever it was, I don't remember when it was, it was 60s or something. Mm-hmm. They used to think that you would spontaneously combust if you ran underneath a four minute mile and he obviously didn't mm-hmm. um he was so good and so adamant in the fact that he even ran it in work shoes because he forgot his sneakers on the day I didn't know that. so he literally yeah. borrowed shoes and then ran the four minute mile and then just went fuck i'm the king yeah and now people yeah. are talking about him fucking 60 years later yeah um but since then a week later 10 more people did it yeah since then thousands of cunts have done that yeah so I think, again, it's a nice reminder to be able to go, all right, cool. Like if I follow the same footsteps, if I do go the same path, if I put a disproportionate amount of effort into this thing, I can really make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And th- my next question was going to be, who do you look at as an inspiration outside of jiu-jitsu? But it's good to know that you're using that as your answer within jiu-jitsu because using their mindset and carrying that into your sport. Yeah, I, I look about it like this, right? Like, just because you're good at jiu-jitsu doesn't mean you're just good at that. It means you have the necessary championship qualities. Mm. Whereas if you were to put yourself into another sport, had you given the amount of effort... People talk about LeBron James all the time. If you would have played football, he would have been just as good. Okay. Because he has the characteristics and the habits, the knowledge, the wisdom, the skills, and experience underneath what he is good at. Okay, like, yeah. he chose basketball, but mm. I think he could have chose tennis. He mm. could have chose NFL. He could have chose anything. And I'm living proof of that. Mm. I come from rugby league. I played that for 17 years. And now I've fast become one of the best athletes to have ever lived in Australia at like, like this current point in time um, in another sport, having done it for less than three years, Yeah, which is kind of fucking unheard of. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's, it's exact proof of what I'm talking about where- just because you are in one sport doesn't mean that you can't cross apply all those lessons. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for business. Like I run two online businesses now. I look to people in that realm and I think, hey, these guys are saying the same shit that the sports guys are saying. Mm. It's like, where does this Venn diagram lap over? Mm. And then now where are the the, the commonalities? Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of commonalities. There's a lot of commonalities in terms of sex, successful people where they're highly disagreeable. Mm-hmm. They don't agree on a lot of things. They don't They don't just allow things to happen. Like, like I said, I have a very big disdain for authority. I'm hugely disagreeable. Like I wouldn't put a fucking mask on in the lockdown to save anybody. Oh, I, yeah. I did not give a fuck. Yeah. It's like- the only reason I thought that is because I don't want you telling me what to do. Yeah. The secondary reason later on when the research came out, I was like, yeah. oh, it's fucking bullshit. Yeah. Um, but simple things like that, right? It's it's high level of disagreeableness. Um, uh, usually, it's an ego problem, like where they deserve, they, they think they deserve a lot more than what they are currently getting. And that depends if that's harnessed correctly. 
if you sit there and you're a victim of your circumstances and you say, fuck, I deserve way more than this, you put in no effort, you're a fuckwit. Yeah, yeah. If you go, I deserve way more than this, how am I going to fucking attack life and get it? Mm-hmm. You're going to be successful. Yeah. There's no other way around it. Yeah. And there's one more quality. It is escaping me, but if it comes to me, I'll-, I'll Yeah, just chuck know. it in. Yeah. yeah. But those are two key factors. Mm-hmm. And that's Michael Jordan was a cunt to okay. play with. Okay. Steve Jobs was a cunt to work for. Mm-hmm. They're all disagreeable people. Yeah. They don't fit in well with society. They are outliers. Mm-hmm. And, and that is representative of their personality traits, also their habits and all that sort of stuff. Kobe Bryant was a lovely guy, um, but he was notorious for being like completely introverted in, within training. He'd show up two hours early, yeah. do all the sessions, do all the skills, then play, then do extras after that. Yeah. And it just becomes this like sickening work ethic where- there's got to be a reason for driving that because it's not normal. Mm, yeah. And if you don't want to be normal, you have to figure out what the not normal people are doing. Yeah. And it, and it makes a lot of sense because I also feel that within myself as well. Look, in my job or my career, whatever I'm choosing to focus on, mm. I've always said it to everyone, I could have actually been this good at anything. It just depended on what I chose to do. I yeah. just happened to have chose this. You yeah. know what I mean? And my, I've had employers tell me the same thing that have run, that run very successful businesses. They said, it didn't matter what business I chose to do, I was going to become successful. Yeah. Yeah. It, had, it's, it definitely makes sense. And I like that you're able to relate the, the similarities between successful business people and sports people. Because I think about things like that. So yeah. I'm curious as to, as to more. And you say this is in your course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, um, this whole ethos comes from Miyamoto Masashi, Book of Five Rings. He says, once you know the way deeply in one thing, you know it in all things. Oh, yeah. And I've started to realize that because I knew the way very deeply in rugby league. I knew the way very deeply in weightlifting. I've been doing that for 11 years. Mm-hmm. I've been studying mindset and personal development for 11 years as well. And so people go to me, they're like, how the fuck did you get so good in two years in jiu-jitsu? I was like, well, 17 plus 11 plus 11 is whatever the fuck it is, 48. Yeah. Um, the 38? 40, yeah, 38. 39. 39. There you go. Oh, shows how good I am at maths. <laughs> um, but I've been doing this for 39 years. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Like in time in mm. and time into extrapolating those properties and characteristics and those habits and learning from different people and all that sort of stuff. That's how I start to think of it. So it's like I've actually been doing this sport for 40 years because I've cross applied all these different bits and pieces. Once you realize that everything is all the same, like if I said to you, this uh, this sports athlete, he's incredibly dedicated. He does what needs to be done. He shows up on time. He's got a fucking good handshake. He dedicates himself. He never takes days off, never whinges. If I didn't tell you who that was, could you relate that to a sports star? Could you relate that to a business person? Could you relate that to a busy CEO? Could you relate that to a really good mother? Mm -hmm. Could you relate that to any high achiever in any topic? Of course you fucking could. So really, it's what characteristics bond these people together, not what they are represented within. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very cool. I like that. I had something I wanted to chuck in there, and it fucking slipped my mind too. So if I think of it, I'll I'll chuck that out as well. Um. I became aware of you through Fossey and because mm-hmm. he, we were at a Bucks party and he was, um, tell, I think it was like four or five in the morning and he was saying, I'm about to watch this Las Vegas tournament. Oh, and yeah, then cool. He actually told, told me about you and I ended up fucking going to sleep. <laughs> it was, yeah. It wasn't it was for early. Me. Yeah. It was it early. It wasn't for me, but he stayed up and powered through it. How did you, well, actually, let's start because I am aware, but for everyone listening who might not be, what is the tournament and how did you find yourself becoming involved in it? So ADCC is uh, its an acronym for Abu Dhabi Combat Club. It's run by an oil sheik in Abu Dhabi. It's pretty cool, actually. I think it was started in 1998 and it's the premier jiu-jitsu competition in the world. And basically what he wanted was uh, UFC without the punching. He wanted okay. the best grapplers, the best wrestlers, the best judokas, the best jiu-jitsu guys all in one tournament, all in one place battle it out and let's see who's the best. And was he a martial artist himself? I think so, yeah. I think yeah. he trains. I'm, yeah. I'm almost certain that he trains. I think he's a jiu-jitsu black belt. Um, but yeah, so it's one of those things where um, he just decided to create this event and he's, there's there's five weight classes. There's 66, 77, 88, 99, 99 plus. I obviously compete 99 plus. Um, and there's 16 people in each weight class. Now, every year, there's eight people who are invited per weight class and eight people who have to win their spot. And there's four different regions. So there's North America, there's uh, Brazil, there's Europe, and then there's Asia and Oceania. So I'm the 99 kilo Asia and Oceania champion, um, as is like my teammate Jeremy Skinner for the 66 kilo division. So the champions who get invited back are people who typically come first, second, and third the two years prior. It's kind of like the Olympics, but it's two-year intervals instead of four-year intervals. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then people who are like legends and stuff like that or previous champions from like 
four, five, six years ago, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a new crop of people who win their way and earn their way to that. Uh, there's eight different trials all around the world. So there's Europe twice. There's North America East, North America West. Brazil get to and uh, Australia Oceania get to. So next year, um, they run the trials on the odd year and then they run the um, the competition on the even year. Typically, COVID kind of fucked that up a little bit where it was the other way around, but now they've had, just had to adjust. Um, so next year will be in Thailand and Singapore for Asia and Oceania. Mm. Um, last time when I made it, it was do or die. There was only one trial in Australia because the comp was coming up. They didn't have enough time to run two trials. Mm -hmm. So they basically said, well, you got one shot and then that's yeah. it. So I got one shot, took it, submitted my way all the way through the weight, uh, all the way through the weight class. I think I had the matches. The matches were meant to be six minutes each. I had three minutes total match time. We just fucking just wow. destroyed everybody. Wow. The last wow. one before to get into the final was a forty-five second rear naked choke. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, fucked that mad. cunt's day up. Yeah, um, yeah, he yeah he tried to do the big man game and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, and then ended up winning a decision in the final against a really tough opponent. Um, super experienced. He came second at the previous trials. He's all come also come second at this trials. He's going to come second at next trials yeah. as well. I love um, the attitude, yeah. Oh, man. It's just, it's, yeah. if I could do that in less than two years, imagine what four years of training is going to look like. It's yeah. just a fucking game over. Yeah. yeah. Um, like the, the way that I set up my life and the way that I systematize things and how autistic I am, mm -hmm. um, exponential growth is nothing but a formality. Like it's just going to continue. So yeah. you win the trials, you get to go to Vegas in September. Uh, that was this year. We flew over a little bit early, went to Texas first for two weeks to train the best team in the world. Uh, and then we flew to Vegas, stayed there for a couple of days. Uh, and then the comp was on the Saturday and the Sunday. They run it across two days. Mm -hmm. It was a cool experience. It was really good. I've, yeah. I've been in front of crowds in rugby league that were three times the size. So I wasn't really too like, yeah. you know, hesitant around the crowd or nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a really cool experience. I ended up losing in the first round to widely considered the top three at least guy to ever wow. do nogi jujitsu wow. um especially in adcc competition uh he's currently has a rival with gordon ryan who's the number one person to ever do it mm -hmm. um depending on who you think he's he's probably considered the number one at the moment he's five gold medals in three appearances which wow. is fucking wow. really impressive yeah um so he went yeah. gold he went gold and silver in 2017 Gold, gold in 2019, uh, and then gold, gold in 2022 because he won his weight class and the super fight. Mm -hmm. The super fight happens when you win the absolute division. The absolute division is all weight divisions combined. Mm -hmm. You get 16 people from all of the weight divisions, and whoever wins that is the absolute. They're basically the king, yeah. right? Because if you win that and you're 88 kilos, you beat all these big fucking gigantic orcs like myself. Yeah. Like, man, you're doing some good shit. Does that happen? I was going to ask. Like, does, that doesn't sound like uh, that happen too often. It sounds not, like the heaviest people would usually get the best. Typically. So, the guy that won it this year was Yuri Samos. He's under 99 kilos, but he's kind of like the second heaviest weight class. So, yeah, it tends to be more heavy people that win it. Yeah. Uh, Gordon was in the under 99 last last time around. He beat uh, Marcus Almeida Buchecha. The guy before that, uh, Felipe Pena, was in the over 99 class. He ended up beating, I think, Buchecha as well. Mm. I'm not sure who he beat. I don't remember. It was obviously three years before I started the sport. Yeah. Um, but yeah, typically it's the guys in the 99 and the under 99 that end up winning. Um, but the, you do have breakouts like Lachlan Giles from Melbourne who ends up submitting not one, not two, but three 99 kilo guys in the wow. 77 kilo division. Oh, wow. Yeah, he'll hook three guys in a row in under like two minutes. Oh, wow. And ended up winning the bronze medal in the absolute division as a 77 kilo guy. And he didn't yeah. even make the 77 kilo limit. Oh, yeah. He's like 74 kilos. <laughs> tiny, tiny, tiny. You see this guy in the street, you're like, I beat the fuck out of him. Like, yeah. no, you. <laughs> yeah. he would be on you, on your back so much faster than you can blink mm -hmm. and you'd be asleep. Yeah. I, yeah. Bet, I bet you hear this a lot because- it's so it was it was so strong with me the feeling I've always had a bit more confidence than I probably should have mm -hmm. to be honest I carry myself when it comes to even fighting with way more confidence than I even have mm -hmm. I'm not as experienced as like to think I am but when I went to um, that jujitsu class mm -hmm. I kind of look around and you think oh I'll be able to take this can't I'll be able to take this can't and dude I got fucking folded like yeah. I, I loved it but I loved it it was humbling yeah. but fucking women and fucking people that you don't expect to do it they're all just fucking you oh yeah mate. oh yeah. It, yeah it happens all the time it happened to me when i first started um it genuinely did because i came from rugby league i've been tackling 130 kilo samoans all my life and i'm mm. like fuck i've got these cunts and then uh, uh, start getting <laughs> yeah. choked out yeah. and um it, it's cool because it kind of self-selects 
right? If you go to a boxing gym and there's there's all these guys here, you kind of look around, they can get a lucky punch on you, they can knock you out on day one. Mm -hmm. It can happen. Yeah. It literally can happen. Like yeah. it's it's increasingly less frequent as mm -hmm. you start to get better and better at slipping and dodging and stuff like that. But you know, you don't see a punch coming, it hits you in the head, knocks you out. Yeah. Well, no everyone, one everyone's got an overhand at the end of the day. It's 100%. a scary thing about boxing, yeah. There is absolutely zero chance someone comes in on the first day and submits me. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely zero chance. Like, yeah. I would have to have fucking lung cancer before that would happen. Yeah. I'd have to, like, be dead. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, I'd have to be unconscious <laughs> for them to do anything. Yeah. Like, there are no accidental submissions. Yeah. That's never, sense. ever going to happen. Yeah. And that's kind of the beautiful thing is it's like it's a proper meritocracy. Mm -hmm. It's like the merit of the idea is always the thing that holds true. It's not the authoritarian version of, like, oh, well, I'm better at you. I'm better than you because I've been doing this longer. It's like, no, it's just there's, there's no luck in involved there's mm -hmm. no coincidence um there's no circumstance involved um and it's funny that you explained that story we had a guy come in last night and he was talking a bit of shit on the internet saying that one of my mates didn't deserve his bell all this sort of stuff and he found out real fucking quick about yeah. <laughs> about talking shit on the internet <laughs> yeah. um he ended up nice. quitting it took him a minute to come up and roll, roll me mm -hmm. so the round goes five minutes we usually roll for mm -hmm. At four minutes something he decides to get up and finally start rolling me and then he quit with a minute to go <laughs> And yeah. yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave right. it at that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. That's awesome. Um, you mentioned just before when you're talking about these champions, how number three has a rivalry against number one. I was yeah. curious to know if you had any rivalries right now, if you've had any in the past. Everyone sucks. Everyone, <laughs> yeah. everyone sucks. You're calling out everyone else. Yeah, everybody point. sucks. Yeah. I, like, no, there's there's some people who have beat me in black like, decisions and stuff like that. And you know what? I, I beat myself. I take full ac accountability. I take full responsibility for my actions, not for their actions. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that no nobody nobody can beat me mm -hmm. in in the right context. In the right, and I don't want to come off like a dickhead saying this. Like Sean O'Malley is like, oh, I'm fucking mentally undefeated or stuff like that. I can beat me. It's just a matter of whether they capitalize on that. Yeah. And that and that could be I didn't prepare myself correctly. That could be I didn't show up on the day correctly. That could be uh, I took it too easy. I didn't get out of second gear fast enough. But I think thinking like that gives you the ultimate power to change your own outcomes because mm. it's all based on your own actions. Mm. It's sitting there and saying, well, this guy's just better than me because he's been doing this, this, and this, and reasoning to yourself as to why that guy's better. I think that's a, it's a trap. Yeah. It, it's not intelligent. It's not smart. It's a bit of a trap. If you own your actions 100%, like I lost against Felipe Penner in the first round. He scored eight points on me. Like eating shit is not my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. But eating shit 10,000 times is the way you get good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just how it works. That'll be a funny clip. <laughs> eating shit 10,000 times is the secret to success. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So start yeah. eating. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Find a pig farm somewhere. When you um, went to Las Vegas, it looked like, as you just mentioned, you met uh, Jacko. Who else did you get to meet? Because I've seen you had a lot of posts on your Instagram. Yeah. So um, funny story. I met Nate Diaz. Mm -hmm. um, That's cool. Yeah, Stockton gangster. He was sitting three rows behind my missus in like the fucking upper echelon of the bleachers, like by himself, mm -hmm. literally by himself, stoned out of his brain. Yeah. Um, and he started walking down the stairs as I started walking up, and I was like, like I'd just walking up the stairs, and he just got up out of his seat, and he's just sitting there by himself, and I was like, the fuck, it's Nate Diaz. Mm. I said, I was like, dude, do you reckon I can get a photo? He's like, yeah, man, no worries, man. I was like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, just watching grappling, man. I love it. And I was like, <laughs> okay. I took a photo with him, and he's fucked off. Yeah. Wow. Didn't say another word. Just left. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Um, who else did I meet? Fist bump Joe Rogan. Oh, no way. Massive highlight. Can't. That'd be the highlight of my Huge life. Huge highlight. So, Jeremy Skinner, my teammate, he had just won his match against AJ Agazar. Um, and we were walking back. And Gordon, who I'd been training with uh, in the same room for the last two weeks, was sitting next to Rogan because they're good mates. They've been on the podcast a bunch of times. Yeah. And uh, he sponsored Gordon. He sponsored the event as well. And I was like, holy fuck. Mm -hmm. Rogan's like right there yeah so i went and like gordon raised his fist up and then joe did it as well and i'm like oh. i was like i'm never <laughs> washing this hand ever again <laughs> fucking crazy man because you watch like you you feel like you know the guy yeah 100 percent. because you watch yeah. thousands of hours like yeah. i did my spotify rap yesterday yeah and I had like 52,000 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, did I really listen to that much music? What a fucking loser. And then the podcast section comes up and it's like 38,000 yeah. minutes of Joe Rogan. I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That, that makes yeah. me feel a little bit better. Um, I didn't even know there was a podcast section. I was hoping when I looked at mine yesterday, I could see how much I did in podcasts. So yeah. I'll have a look for that. Cause, yeah. yeah, it says it at the end of like what, what your favorite show was or stuff like that. They do mm -hmm. a podcast section. Um, I had actually stopped my original one. It was cool because like two, three years ago when I started my original one, heaps of people 
sent me photos of like, oh, you're in my top five, you're in my top five. It's mm-hmm. really cool, it's really cool. And um, I only really do like little 10 minute snippets now, now, like just solo by myself. I literally plug a road mic into my phone and hit voice notes. Yeah, okay. Um, but people fucking love it. So yeah. I'm just going to keep doing it once a day. But obviously, yeah. if I was doing hour episodes, the time would have racked up, but they're only 10, 15 minutes and I started it like eight weeks ago so it wouldn't okay. have been it wouldn't have cracked anyone's top five i'll give it a listen for sure 100%. yeah that's, that's good. good i talk about the same shit we're talking about now pretty <laughs> yeah, much yeah. yeah yeah still i like it i like showing uh interest in local things as well you know what yeah. I mean? it makes me feel fucking a bit more part of a community when i'm listening to other people make content or yeah things like that. i get that yeah cool. i get that i can't believe bro fist bump and joe rogan that'd be the highlight of my life that's cool I swear to God. <laughs> it, was, it was very cool it was a yeah. cool experience yeah and when you met these people, did you get a bit of like a sense that everyone's kind of just like a normal person or do you feel like yeah. they're celebrities? Nah, that was that was it? pretty much what I took away from everything. Um, I took away from like being with what would seem jujitsu royalty mm-hmm. um, as like they're all the same dudes. They eat like me. They shit like me. They bleed like me. It's all the same shit. They've just yeah. been doing the sport for a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. And it's again, it's a nice reminder. It's like you just keep moving in the same direction and you mm-hmm. keep going. You don't give up. Uh, you start to put things in place that help you get there. Mm. Sweet. Yeah. Just, keep, just keep moving. And I see you actually train with uh, Pedro as well. I've seen that on your Instagram. Pedro. Fucking. Yeah, Tyson Pedro. Isn't it? Tyson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I train with him. He's like my main training partner when he comes in. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I'm his main training partner, rather, when he comes into Sydney West. And he does most of his jiu-jitsu with us when he's not in fight camp. Mm-hmm. I think he's in New Zealand right now doing fight camp for um, Perth coming up in January. Yeah. But, um, yeah, same thing. Lovely dude. Really, really switched on. Um, knows exactly what he wants, and he fucking works hard to get it. Yeah, you got you got a uh, a blessful situation to be able to meet these people. Well, mind you, you actually put in the work to get yourself in these positions. Mm-hmm. I don't take that away from you. Mm-hmm. But being able to train with people like him and meet these people that you look up to, it's pretty pretty awesome feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking weird, hey, because I get heaps of people sending me messages on Instagram like, "Oh, you're an inspiration," all this sort of stuff. I was like, why? <laughs> like, I'm just an autistic kid that like it does thing on autopilot. Um, no, I, I take a, I take a certain amount of responsibility to put a, a good image out. Um, I don't fake anything. I refuse that. Mm-hmm. Um, like my two highest values are authenticity and courage. I don't believe in ever ever trading them in for anything. Um, so I like to project a certain ideal um that is the the authentic version of me um and if people find that inspiring that's really great Mm -hmm. if they find it fucking annoying and egotistical and arrogant Mm -hmm. fuck off i could (laughs) care less i don't think many people would be honest oh there's there's a few oh really there's a few um could care less yeah because i know that it's a net positive impact Mm -hmm. and i'm going to continue to do it i had this weird thing when i was 16 and i sort of said to myself i've always thought this way like i really always have at 13 years of age um i asked my mum to start cooking healthier dinners at 12 years of age i quit soft drink mm-hmm. um i've since reneged back on that they have like a fucking pepsi max every now and again fucking sue me yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just one of those things i've always thought like this i've always thought i deserved more and i always thought that life was a bit of a uh, a sham considering like the nine to five and all this sort of thing and just yeah. grow up and die and get your super out when you're 60 and maybe you afford that fifty thousand dollar car you wanted like <laughs> fuck you there's cunts who drive houses on wheels yeah. you don't want to be one of those cunts yeah. not even to be an asshole about it just yeah. have the opportunity yeah. you know what i mean so i've always thought like this and i had this thought and this was around when i was like two years into the gym so i was 16 and i was fucking cracking out on Ziz videos mm-hmm. he was the one that got me into the gym yeah. like arnold schwarzenegger and Ziz. Yeah. i was like i, I don't words is a little bit on this podcast yeah he's yeah. the man yeah the man anyway yeah. um spirit. i said to i said to myself i was like fuck i'm gonna impact a million people's lives Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. I'm wow. going to change it for the better. I'm going to figure, I don't know where this thought came from. Rogan has this theory that thoughts are actually living organisms and you inherit mm-hmm. them. And so he said that recently. Yeah. Um, and to a point, I agree. Mm-hmm. To a point. I 100% agree To a point, that, I agree. Yeah. Um, and yeah, man, it's crazy because I started a TikTok audience fucking seven, seven weeks ago mm-hmm. and over 3 million people have seen my shit. Yeah, wow. Well, so whether yeah. that's gene- like whether that's genuinely impacting them is a different story. I think it's more legitimate when I have like a million followers across social media. Yeah. Um, but fuck me, I'm going yeah. the right way about it to yeah. get there. So it's interesting the thoughts that kind of hit you and the, the ones that stick with you for a long period of time and that you can't get rid of. Mm-hmm. And I think if you can start to take a curiosity into those sorts of things and start to develop a way to bring them into fruition, mm-hmm. I think that best serves people in their life. And people always talk about, well, what's my life's purpose? You don't know until you start doing shit. That's why I always tell people violent action mm-hmm. is the fucking way. Yeah. Nothing else. Like, and how do you know you're good at something until you try it? Mm. 
How do you know you suck at something until you try it? Yeah. Well, guess what? You're going to suck at everything you try at the first go unless you're some fucking freak at bowling and you didn't even know and you just have this natural <laughs> aptitude for it. But then again, at a professional level, you're going to suck compared to the guys who did apply themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, don't get me wrong, there's natural athletes all over the place where they're really fast or they're really strong or everybody knows a Samoan kid that can bench press 100 kilos on his first day. Mm -hmm. But then you get to the elite level and you realize that there's a few of those people and yeah. they're the ones who fucking work hard to get it. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, I see the blueprint. Even if I am naturally gifted or naturally talented, I still have to fucking work my ass off. Yeah. And there's no other way around it. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And just back to even when it comes to we call I call it well, I talked about it on the last episode, intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this on the last episode, but there's a quote I heard that said, You're not the you're not the creator of your own thoughts, you're merely the observer. Mm -hmm. You're just a roommate listening mm -hmm. in. And when an important thing like that comes, like you had when you were sixteen, mm -hmm. I want to impact a million people's lives. I reckon a lot of people would have a, a thought like that into their mind at some point in their life, but you're actually capitalizing on that and you're taking advantage of it, which is pretty awesome to see. I think TikTok's a great way to do it, bro. Oh, yeah. Fucking great way. What a cheat code. Eh? Yeah. Like, fuck. Well, it's 100%. It's like it's, it's putting yourself in the position to become the authority in any given area, right? And I was I actually give credit to my missus all the time. I said, it's your fault I'm blowing up on that platform because she was like, you should be posting on there, blah, blah, blah. I was like, fuck, I don't want to be around those 12-year-old virgins, all this sort of <laughs> shit. And I just heard bad things about it. And so, again, I had to eat my own advice. Mm -hmm. How do you know you're going to suck at something until you do it? How do you know you're going to be great at something until you do it? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, all right, well, I put one video up and it got like 400 views. And I'm like, oh, well, fuck, could have done that on Instagram. Yeah. And then I went, no, take your own advice, you dickhead. Yeah. If you can't do it forever, don't do it for a day. And um, you have to be able to find a way where it would be unreasonable for you to get what you want mm -hmm. through violent action. And for me, can the you, way can that- you elaborate that a little bit? Yeah. So the, so the way that I'm practically applying that, for, for me to not be- uh, For me, it would be unreasonable for me to be one of the best jiu-jitsu athletes of all time if I keep training the way I do for a sustained period of a decade. Okay. Okay. I'm committing for a decade. Done. And mm -hmm. let's see what happens. And that doesn't just mean 10 years. That just means I am already written that I'm going to do it for at least 10 years. I'm going to do it for as long as it takes, mm -hmm. but I'm already doing it for 10 years. And I think if you can think on long-term time horizons, you get outsized returns because the most thing that stops most people is this idea that they get this idea in their head and they get really excited about it. And I forget the term of what it's called, but it's it's an initial idea when you get really excited and it lasts for about four weeks. Mm -hmm. Then the initial excitement and motivation starts to wane and drop off and it starts to get a little bit harder. And then you realize what the actuality of the activities you are committing to. That's where most people give up, yeah. change topics, regain that four week motivation and then slip back down and then they change mm -hmm. topics. That's why no one ever gets anywhere because they're always chopping and changing things. Mm -hmm. So I think, okay, well, if that's what everybody's doing and this is everybody's broke, depressed, overweight, and sad, mm -hmm. let's flip that and only commit to things for 10 years. Yeah. So now I start to think about it in that framework. It's yeah. like, what can I commit to for 10 years? Well, with the TikTok thing, I can commit to posting three to five times a day for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do that mm -hmm. and see where it takes me because it's not about the outcome. It's about the actions of what delivers you character traits, habits, knowledge, wisdom, and experience. Because if I do something for 10 years, every single day, three to five times a day, it's unreasonable for me to not have a level of discipline. Yeah. It's unreasonable for me to not have a level of stick to itness, mm -hmm. a, a level of foresight and a level of being able to fucking grit and grind and all those sorts of things. If I, again, well, like I was talking about the athletes and the business people, if I can apply those to one area of my life, I can apply them to all areas of my life. And I'm already doing that with jujitsu. I'm already doing that with everything else. This was kind of the idea of me putting so much effort and intensity into this is because if I commit myself to something fully, and this is true for everybody listening, if I commit myself to something fully, in the last two years, I've achieved what nobody else has been able to achieve. Mm. Why the fuck can't I do that in business yeah. or on social media yeah. or reading a fucking book or making a fucking coconut order. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it doesn't matter where you place that energy because it's about the characteristics. Yeah. If you can gain those characteristics and you realize, holy shit, I'm actually really good at this. I tell these people uh, all the time. I do online coaching and I coach a lot of people who are very involved in their work. Everybody works 40, 50, 60 hours a week, whatever. And they're fucking killing it at work. But they can't lose weight. Okay. And they're like, what the fuck's going on? Like, mm. this is ridiculous. They've never articulated it to themselves mm. that they are an expert in what they do at their job. I said, you're already successful. They go, what the fuck do you mean? I was like, 
Look at how you've progressed through your career. Look how you've just knocked down objective after objective after objective and fucking just gone through all these hassles and jumped over all these hurdles and you've got yourself to a place where you're actually happy with. Don't you realize that if you've done that there, you can do that with weight loss because it's the exact same thing. Mm. And then they go, fuck. I say, you just need to have to, you just need to figure out what you need to say to yourself for you to do it in terms of weight loss. Yeah. The same thing with you. You're probably really good at what you're doing for work based on what you were saying 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Do that for sobriety. You've already done it. You're already successful in this area, which means you have tasted success, which means you know how to attain it. Mm -hmm. Because whether you think about it or not, you've done it. Yeah. And this is the thing that I tell people. It's a really cool analogy. And people go, oh, I I struggle with habits. I said, no, you fucking don't. They're like, oh, yes, I fucking do. And then they fight me for their own limitations. And I go, all right, I'm going to tell you a story. When you were five years old, you decided that you were going to take the responsibility or your parents decided you were going to take the responsibility of brushing your teeth. You did it for about two weeks straight. You were super consistent. And then one night, you jump into bed. You haven't done it. You forget. You're a five-year-old. You forget these things. You didn't do it. And you're, fuck this, I'm not doing it. Or maybe you're five years old. You're saying, I'm not doing this. But yeah, anyway, you fuck this, I'm not doing it. Your parents come in, they're like, bruv, those wristles, I can smell them on your breath from two meters away. Go and fucking clean your teeth. You're like, ah, ah, ah. you yeah. whinge, you bitch, you moan, you get it done. 20 years later, how many days have you missed in a row? Yeah, I, fuck, I don't know the last time I missed brush my teeth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And morning, night. Yeah. Every fucking day. Yeah. Without motivation. Mm. without any other feeling attached to it, without any other perceived result attached to it. Because when is the only time you get a benefit from brushing your teeth? Mm. It's either when you stop doing it because you realize how bad your fucking breath stinks, yeah. or it's when the dentist every six months to a year goes, good job, buddy. Yeah. If I told yeah. you to do something twice a day, every day, and the only time you'd ever get fucking reward out of it was some guy telling you, good job, buddy, every six to 12 months, would you, fi- you think you'd fucking do that? Yeah. Absolutely not, except you have. Yeah. It's reality. Mm-hmm. If I said 10 push-ups twice a day, every single day for 20 years, how many people would actually commit to that? Mm. And yet you do it every single day. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you're not giving yourself the credit you deserve because you actually have been able to form these habits over a long period of time. You just haven't thought about it that way, which means you have a belief system around it that's stopping you from getting what you want. And then you'll fight for your beliefs because as soon as you realize that your belief is wrong, you could have been doing it for five years already. Yeah. Man, I, like the, I love the way you articulated it as well. It's I, I'm fucking feeling the effects of it because I actually know that I live my life in a similar way, yeah. but I'm not even consciously thinking about it. Obviously, mm-hmm. subconsciously, it's all going on, mm-hmm. but I've never- put depth into those thoughts at all. Especially yeah. when you say how like these people are succeeding in their careers but they're not losing any weight. Yeah. I, I think about that all the time. If I'm successful at what I do for work, I'm going to have a successful podcast. It's just gonna take ten years, as you're saying. It's years. the same method. It's yeah. just in different clothing. Yeah. yeah. That's it. It's just a wardrobe change. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it is. That's mad. You I'm definitely gonna think about this a lot tonight. Oh yeah, I've ruined your tonight. afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Hundred yeah. percent. I say that yeah. after every consult call that I do. I've ruined your day. Just so you know that you'll be thinking about me when you go to bed. Yeah. And they're like, "Yeah, it's not a bad thing." I was like, oh, yeah. "Maybe." Um. Oh, well, I want to get. Um. I'll. I'll come back to when you said you do coaching people and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But first, I want to know how much time do you invest into jujitsu? Uh. So I do thirteen sessions a week, probably around. Well, I don't know, thirteen, fifteen hours a week. Yeah. Actual training time. Mm-hmm. Um. And then all the driving and everything else. But um. Yeah, 13 sessions a week, so. Mm-hmm. And what about, like, do you do many research? Do you have, like, an, is there, like, because I, I don't know anything about it. Is there any content you could watch about it? I do study like as that? well. Yeah, yeah, study about half an hour a day. Okay. Yeah, so all in all, it's probably about 20 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And then with your other free time, I'm going to call it free time, but it's not in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Do you have a job? Do you work? Like, what do you do? In those Just the online business stuff. Online so, business stuff. So, yeah, marketing, sales, all that sort of stuff, online coaching, um just for like for my own stuff i do content creation all that sort of shit mm-hmm. um and then yeah pretty much that's it if people ask me like what do you do for fun i was like fuck i don't know man go out and eat steak and then just go back to work <laughs> yeah. and like isn't that boring i was like i actually had this conversation with my housemate yesterday and a lot of people would look at the things that i do on a day-to-day basis and i do the same thing every single day and they go fuck that would be boring and i said how boring is being able to take a day off whenever you want it mm-hmm. how boring is being able to focus on yourself 24 7 how yeah. boring is being able to do whatever the fuck you want whenever the fuck you want Mm. how boring is being able to do a sport you love and have it be more hours in per week than you actually do your job yeah and how boring is it that your job is something you're fucking curiously fascinated with and you're addicted to Mm -hmm. and then they're like oh 
yeah, that is better than working at Woolies. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it fucking is. Yeah. I was like, it's not that boring at all. Yeah. But the thing is, like, I did a podcast on this, episode seven. I was like, boredom is better. Mm-hmm. The more times that you can do boring things for a longer period of time, the more you're going to outwork everybody else. Yeah. Because people get to a certain stage of boredom. It's the exact same thing with hunger. People get to a threshold of hunger where they think that they have to eat. You don't have to eat for three to four weeks. You Uh, have to drink water. I can't. I swear to you, I can't go more than six hours. You 100% can. (laughs) If I tied you down and took food away from you for three days, you'd be fine. Fuck. You'd be fine. You'd have to realize that the hunger signal can be ignored. Mm -hmm. I tell this to guys all the time, especially young men. Just because you're horny doesn't mean you touch your dick. Yeah. Do not fucking jack off. Do not watch porn. Yeah. It is a waste of your time and it's fucking up your dopamine in your brain. And they go, oh, but what if it's really intense? I, d- I don't care. Mm. I don't care how hungry you are. Like, I can be angry and not punch a cunt in the face, yeah. Yeah, which means you can be I'm hungry and not eat a sandwich. Yeah. You can be sad and not slit your wrist. Mm-hmm. It's possible. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go to these crazy extremes where you're like, oh my God, I'm hungry, I'm going to die. You're not. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, I'm horny, I'm going to die. You're not. Mm-hmm. You can ignore these sorts of things. And you, I actually think to a certain degree, your ability to ignore those feelings and continue to do what you were going to do anyway will actually determine whether you're going to be successful or not in any given area. Mm-hmm. Like think about pain or tiredness. Like when you came to jiu-jitsu, you are probably tired as fuck Mm -hmm. i'm probably this a similar level of tired although i'm much more well conditioned i'm probably a similar level tired because my intensity is higher because i'm more conditioned Mm -hmm. like it's like people that go oh yeah but lifting weights must be so easy for you because you're so strong and i was like well 60 kilos is still 60 kilos no matter how fucking way you slice it it's always going to be 60 kilos in reference to me it's easy but it still weighs 60 kilos Mm -hmm. it's the same thing jiu-jitsu is still at like a 75 85 percent intensity I just don't perceive it that way. And I ignore if I am tired because it's irrelevant to me. Yeah. I'm going to be tired. I yeah. know that. I knew what I was signing up for. Yeah. I've still got work to do. I'm yeah. still going to get shit done. Yeah. It kind of doesn't matter. It's like when you're fucking knee deep in a business project that you want to do like I was yesterday. I didn't eat lunch until fucking 3.30. Mm-hmm. I don't have time. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm hungry. I don't care. <laughs> i got shit to do. Yeah. And when I'm fucking, when I stop doing my shit, then I'll go get food. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah. And guess what? I was fine in either situation. If I ate at 1.30 or if I ate at 3.30, I was fine. But I needed to get that shit done while the fucking iron was hot. Mm -hmm. I think striking while the iron is hot is very important, especially Mm -hmm. with a creative thing. Um, If you let that creativity go, like I have notes in my phone, even while I'm driving, I'll do voice recordings of notes. If I have an idea for like content generation or a post or something on Instagram that I want to write about or something I think about that's like pretty profound, I'll just jot it down in notes. Mm. Then when I can't think of anything, I'll go, oh, I'll go back to my notes and I'll fucking have a look. How good's the backup folder, say? Eh? You've got to be able to fucking write that shit down, especially <laughs> yeah. if you're doing something creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. So this online coaching that you're doing, mm-hmm. how do, like, what exactly is it? I'm not really too sure on what coaching is. Like, is it coaching in a... I know coaching is in sport coaching, mm-hmm. but I'm, not, I'm assuming it's not what you're doing, sport no. coaching. Oh, it depends, right? It depends on what they want. It depends on what the person wants when they come to me. But basically, the ethos is that, like, I get you to do what you say and say what you do. That's the ethos. And now, like, the application is what I actually charge for that. I actually give away all the things that I do for free. Mm-hmm. Like, apart from, like, the tools and the videos and stuff like that, I, li- I literally do. I tell people how to get fucking better at everything they do on a day-to-day basis, mm-hmm. every day, on stories. And now, whether you do anything with that information is up to you. But it's there. Mm. It's the same thing as like weight loss. If you Google weight loss on fucking Google, there's how many hundred thousands of articles that will tell you how to do it. It's like, do you do anything with the information? No. Does it mean the information is wrong? No. Just means you're not doing it. (laughs) Um, But the implementation of that sort of stuff. So I I work on three things. I work on training, mindset, and nutrition. And then just keeping people accountable towards those sorts of things that within a 16-week period, I no longer have to be a part of their lives. They can actually take that and run with it. And I have fucking amazing success like even jesse yesterday one of my old clients he said it was one of the best investments he's ever had in his entire life his words not mine mm-hmm. um and the things that he lost uh 63 kilos by himself mm-hmm. i didn't do anything wow. this was before he started working with me and then he just wanted to make sure that he dialed in some things um even doing that with himself obviously he's not an expert i wouldn't tell a plumber how to fix my toilet you're not going to tell me how to fucking lose weight mm-hmm. um but he ended up being able to maintain a fucking really good physique and he's like eating more food than he ever has and he's still losing weight, still looking good, still performing well in jiu-jitsu and all that sort of stuff. We've been able to alter some things around his mindset and make sure he's action-focused, not outcome-focused. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much what I do for people. I get people to remove the bullshit of noise inside their own head that keeps them stuck. Because mm-hmm. whether you like it or not, like you and I are no different. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, me and the bum in the street are no fucking different. Yeah. It's just the simple fact that I don't tell myself, 
all this rubbish and reason with myself as to the reason as I, why I can't do things, I reason to myself for the reason as why I can do things. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference between me and the majority of people and how they think. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Like most people sit there and like, like we're just talking about with hunger and stuff like that. They're like, oh, I can't do it because I'm hungry or mm -hmm. I can't do this because of my family didn't fucking raise me right. It's like, yeah. well, fucking find me someone that did raise them right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everybody has their own version of childhood. Some yeah. of them are horrible. Some of them are great. Yeah. People who have great childhoods either end up really good or really shit. People who have bad childhoods really end up really good or really shit. Yeah. It's not the things that have happened to you that determine it. It's how you react to the things that have happened to you. Mm -hmm. It's how you respond to those things. Mm -hmm. And that makes the biggest difference so i think i think sorry no, you're right. i think joe says that um joe rogan says the hardest thing you've ever been through is the hardest thing you've ever been mm -hmm. through and that's as you're saying oh some people complain about the fact that living situation wasn't as good as they were a kid or <clears throat> they might be in a shit situation now and that's why they're giving them themselves as excuses as mm -hmm. to why they're not succeeding but someone who was born from a really rich successful family maybe the dad just didn't give them as much attention as they want that's still or the hardest any. thing that per yeah or any yeah but that's still the hardest thing that person's ever been through there's excuses in every realm of life yeah 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 just like it where does it end like do you do you go down to the kid that gets fucking cancer before it was born and has to be killed before it was born like mm. is that the worst existence on earth or is the worst existence on earth making it to 85 and turning around and realizing you never did anything yeah you know what I mean? It's like what he's exactly right. It's like the worst thing that's happened to you is your definition. Yeah. You can't measure yourself against other people. Like people say this all the time. Like, how are you possibly complaining about that? Because there's someone in Africa starving. I was like, yeah. the fuck is that my problem? Yeah. You know what I mean? I like if you measure yourself yeah. against the worst thing that's ever happened, you don't get to validate any of your own fucking feelings. Yeah. And it's like, well, what am I fucking even doing here then? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. It's crazy. And when it comes to coaching, like, how did you even get into doing it? Like, how did you get Good up question. to where you're doing that? Um, so, I have had multiple jobs. Again, disdain for authority. I got fired from every job I've ever had, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, it was just one of those things where somebody told me that I couldn't do something, and then they were only better than me in the job because they'd been there longer, not because they were more skilled, not mm -hmm. because they were better at the job, just because they'd been there longer or they're a manager or they're older or some shit like that. I was like, yeah. fuck you. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, if you have a, a position of authority and it's valid, sure. Yeah. Sure. My coach, I look up to him. He's mm -hmm. been doing this sport for 16 years. He knows more about it than I do. Mm -hmm. That's a valid That's a valid person to have authority underneath or rather he has authority over me mm -hmm. um, in terms of that one subject. And I listen to those people. It's the same thing with people who earn $100 million a year. They have authority to tell you to shut the fuck up but you know nothing about money because you don't have $100 million. Yeah. Very simple. Um, but anyway, so I had, I had trouble like finding work and stuff that I wanted to do and stick with and stuff like that. I was a barista, a security guard, I worked at Masters, I worked at a nutrition place. I've done a bunch of shit. And um, I come back from breaking my ankle um, South Sydney under 20 second season. So when I was 20 and I went to go back to work at a cafe at Parramatta and I did the trial. I went there and they made me wear pants. I fucking hate wearing jeans. I hate wearing pants. It's just, yeah. I don't like it. They don't fit me well. They're uncomfortable. It's gross. Like if I need to like run or something, it's just, yeah. it's restrictive. I don't like it. Anyway, and they said I had to memorize this menu and this big whole story. And I just basically walked out within the first 10 minutes. I was like, fuck this. I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. Anything but this. Yeah. I sat down at Parramatta Station. There was a billboard for F45. They did like signage and stuff for F45. And mm -hmm. I'd done my certificate three and certificate four in personal training at Souths because they paid for us for like an education allowance. Mm -hmm. I never used it. I was like, what the fuck? Why am I not doing this? I love the gym. I love getting getting bigger, lifting weights and all that sort of shit. I'm really good mm -hmm. at doing that. Why don't I do that for a job? So, all right, fuck it. I'll find the nearest F45 and I'll go work there. So, I ended up working at Glenhaven F45. It was the closest one that was hiring. Um, got the job straight away, which is really cool. And then soon started to realize that, you know, I want to do my own thing and I wanted to, you know, instruct the exercise how I wanted to instruct it. I didn't want to just work at F45 and be a fucking button pusher. Yeah. So, I quit that. Went to another job in Castle Hill where I was at the gym in, in um, C2K or what used to be called C2K. Um, started coaching from there and just basically started doing PTing. And then I got to the same level of um, ceiling, I guess. And it was actually really funny. Again, the disdain for authority. I said I got rid of it. I fucking lied. Um, pulled me into the office one day, the manager, and we were like, we were good mates. And she was kind of like the technician manager, not like the, the gym gym manager. Mm hmm she was like a sub manager. They have a bunch of people at the gym that fucking earn over 100K a year. You do fuck all. Okay. Like it's, it's shit. Yeah. They, again, they've just been there for 20 years. They're not better at me than what I do. It's like, mm -hmm. fuck, whatever. So anyway, I swear a lot. 
Mm-hmm. If you haven't fucking noticed already, yeah, it uh, know, it's yeah. just a secondary nature yeah. thing from growing up in rugby league and all that sort of thing. Anyway, I don't hold back. And somebody somewhere in the gym took offense to that. Yeah, okay. So they told me this in a meeting and they said, look, you need to like watch what you're swearing. I said, can you tell me who the person was so I can go and apologize to them and say, look, sorry, I didn't mean to blah, blah, blah. You know, you play the nice guy, right? Yeah. And they said, no, we can't do that. Mm-hmm. I was like, what the fuck do you mean? <laughs> They're like, oh, they'd rather remain anonymous. I was like, well, then I'd rather continue saying what I'm saying because if I don't know who it's yeah. pissing off, I don't know who it's pissing off. Yeah. And there was this big thing about it. And I like, I went home that day and I sort of sat down in the lounge and I was like, this fucking sucks. I was like, they've given me a problem that I can't take ownership of, that mm-hmm. I can't fix. Mm-hmm. I could stop swinging. Mm-hmm. I could do that. But I can't rectify it with the person who thinks that they've been wronged by my actions, which yeah. really pisses me off. Probably a part of the autism where I like can't leave tasks unfinished. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it really annoyed me and it really got under my skin. I was like, fuck, this sucks. So anyway, three months later, I quit. Mm. I was like, see you later. I had like a successful business. I was making a couple grand a week. I was doing good stuff. I was training people, getting heaps of results, all that sort of shit. Um, and then I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm going to do online. I'm going to see if I can do it on my own. Mm. And- I went after a Christmas period. Um, every PT that's listening to this knows that Christmas period's fucking hell because you get to a stage where they don't have to come back. Yeah. There's like nothing holding them to come back. It's fucking yeah. worst. Anyway, so I lost about 40% of my business, 50% of my business. And um, I was coming back and it like kind of took all the wind out of my sails, especially with like the swearing conversation. Mm-hmm. I was like, fuck, do I really want to do this anymore? I was like, no, nah, I've got to do this on my own. So anyway, I was not in a position to like leave the gym. Yeah. I really needed the money and I was like- yeah. Nah, fuck it. Always back yourself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, two and a bit years later, I fucking uh, mm-hmm. continue to doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I work for myself and I back myself. And I think anybody listening to this, never don't back yourself. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. if, if you back yourself, you always win. Yeah. Because even, even if you leave a job that's paying like 120 grand a year, like fuck good salary, I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's all right. If, yeah. Like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even if you, if you leave a job like that and then you're not making 40 grand, but it's all off your own back, mm. I guarantee you the satisfaction is 10 times. Yeah. 10 times. Yeah. Like, yeah, you might have to drive a fucking shit a car. Yeah, you might have to fucking eat shit of meals. Like, trust me, it gets better. Like, mm. the longer you do things, the better it gets. Um, yeah, it, it's one of those things where if you do it off your own back, substantially better. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe that. I, I've always said I'd make fucking a, a quarter, even a fifth of what I make right now doing mm. something like this. 100% yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not the money that drives you to do what you want to do. Mm. It's the freedom that drives you to do it. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that as well is because everybody thinks to themselves like, oh, if I was a billionaire, I'd just stop working. It's like, that's why you'll never be a billionaire. <laughs> right because it's the characteristics and the traits of the people that they don't measure themselves by the outcomes Mm -hmm. like steve jobs was very famous for having an idea and just being ruthless in the pursuit towards having that idea become fruition now if that idea flopped and he only sold 30 iphones Mm. he wouldn't have been a billionaire but he still would have continued the effort and the work and everything behind it like people at microsoft uh, when bill gates first invented it or started it he never said i want to be a 50 billion dollar person he goes i want computers in every room yeah it's yeah. not about the money. It's about the vision. It's about the characteristics that you have to pursue that vision. Mm. So, like, my vision is help a million people, help a million people get better in their life, think differently, make better choices, all these sorts of things, and that's just continue to evolve and evolve and evolve. And eventually, if that makes me a millionaire, hectic. Oh, I, I can't see it not. I think that success is rewarded in life. I think life will, will reward success. How often do you really meet someone who's given something 100% of their time for most of their life and not? Never. Being rich in fruit. What, yeah, it's not no. happened once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's literally not happened ever. <laughs> yeah. If you give 100% dedication and you obsess over making something happen mm-hmm. and you act violently towards it and you refuse to take small wins and you just like delay, 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 delay gratification and you just keep doing it, keep doing it. Uh, they fucking close your, they close your gym or whatever. They fucking repossess your car. You keep going, you keep going. You keep, every successful cunt on earth has a story like that. Yeah. Les yeah. Brown and Eric Thomas are two of the guys I used to listen to when I was 14 when I first started getting into development les brown is famous for sleeping in the office of the job that he got Mm -hmm. because he had nowhere else to go Mm -hmm. they said mr brown you can't sleep here this is an office not a hotel and he goes i've got nowhere else to go yeah he goes i will put in the hours i will get better than everybody else and he ended up being the top salesman in the company a year later and he fucking is wildly successful as a motivational speaker yeah everybody has a story like that and they just have this obsession of this idea in their head and they just can't let it go Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's like even to a detrimental fact sometimes, like mm. you let everything else go in your life. But if you just get this one thing, then fuck, it's all gravy. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. 
I'll also go back to jujitsu for a sec. Cause I yeah. have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask that Please. I forgot to. And that's as an, I said this before, but I am an outsider looking in. Mm-hmm. So I, correct me if I'm wrong entirely, but it seems to me that Australia might have like a maximum potential you can kind of reach here. And it looks like other countries might have a better, it's a, just a bigger range of growth and knowledge. Mm-hmm. Do you see yourself getting to a maximum potential here? And do you think you might have to move overseas to continue your journey? Yeah. Interesting question. Good question. Um, That gap is waning as we speak. Mm -hmm. The gap is getting closer and closer and closer as we speak. Um, My coach, Luke Martin, is one of the sole proprietors of that reason. Um, And we're starting to close the gap very, very quickly in terms of the training quality and the training knowledge. Um, The only thing that separates us from the US currently, in my opinion, isn't the instruction of technique. It's not the quality of the technique it's not what we are learning it's the training partners that are professional and full-time right, right. that's the only thing so yeah. like in my gym we have myself ethan thomas uh jeremy skinner and baby dave or even ethan thomas not really so myself jeremy skinner baby dave uh so and my and my coach baby dave, Foster yeah told me about, about yeah. Him, yeah yeah and my coach mm-hmm. that's four of us who do jiu-jitsu full-time don't work a normal job uh, and earn money through the sport Mm-hmm. There's four of us. Now, I'm 120 kilos. Mm. Jeremy is 66 kilos. Baby Dave is 77 kilos. Luke is 84 kilos. Wow. So I have a fucking substantial yeah. gap on a lot of those guys. So it doesn't matter how good they are at a world level. I'm fucking double Jeremy's body weight. Mm. And there's nothing he can do about it, yeah. right? So that's kind of the limiting factor. Mm-hmm. Um, that's more of a weight class specific thing to me personally. Um, there's a couple of good guys in Australia in the open division in like the 99 plus. Um, but again, like they're not learning the techniques that we learn. So they're good, mm-hmm. but they could be significantly better mm-hmm. versus the teams in the, in the US from Texas, like B team and new wave and all these other guys. They have elite level guys learning elite level technique. Who it's their fucking sole job to live, breathe and shit the sport. And they have yeah. all different weight classes. Yeah. So there is a big difference. Um, we have like four professional guys, like I said, uh, whereas they have a room of 30. Mm-hmm. So every round is going to be murderer's row. Yeah. You're going to be forced to get better. And the instruction is probably some of the best in the world. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like the separating factor and how I see it at the moment. Again, the gap is closing. Like we've got a couple of good guys above 100 kilos. Um, one of my training partners, Reese, he's getting a lot better. Um, I still beat the fuck out of him every single day. and He's yeah. never submitted me in almost 18 months of training. Yeah. He's getting better. Mm-hmm. Slow. But he's a fucking high school teacher. Yeah. Like, what do you expect, right? Like, this is his hobby. It's Mm -hmm. not his life. If he could train as much as I could, he'd probably be a lot better. Okay. But it's just, it's you know, it's like the schematics of those sorts of things. So, to answer your question properly, no, I don't think I'll have to move to the US. I don't want to. The US is kind of a shithole. Okay. Uh, It was good. I enjoyed the experience. Would I live there? No, absolutely not. Yeah. And maybe this comes back to bite me in the next five years where I actually do end up moving to the US. I don't know. Um. I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd see myself moving there. Um, I've got a lot in Australia. I've got a missus. I've got a dog. I've got all these things that I really enjoy doing. I've got a bunch of mates and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the food quality in America is fucking trash. Yeah, like proper trash. Okay. Like the tex the Texas barbecue is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. The Mexican so good, mm-hmm. but like the general quality of the food is quite poor. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's just a fucking pain in the ass. But um, more when you can buy a fucking full full taco from a servo for like what a dollar. Yeah, um, or even a burrito. I can't yeah. imagine it being too good. No, for you. no, yeah. it's not high quality stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to move to the US. The majority of people that do do it are very good. Um, could they have gotten as good as they are in Australia? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Time will tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, what about outside of US? Because I was actually thinking more like places in Europe or even South America. Like, um, w- w- I don't know what the leading capital of Jiu-Jitsu of the US. world would be. US yeah, is. actually, specifically Austin, Texas. Okay. Yeah, the two um, best teams in the world live in Austin, Texas. Okay. It's really funny because they have like this big divergent split. They used to be one team and now they're two teams. Like a lot of personal differences, a lot of stuff that is not my place to say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not my problem. Yeah. And I'm not involved. Yeah. So I don't really yeah. care. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they split up. And it's funny because they moved from New York to Puerto Rico together. Mm-hmm. And then they came back as separate teams, both in Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's funny. A small town in Texas with mm-hmm. under a million people population has the best jiu-jitsu in the world on two accounts. Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. Pretty crazy. That is cool. And you did answer my question well, but I'm still curious as to if you can see this ceiling coming closer and closer and closer is the only thing that can really help you continue to move forward is a, is a bunch of people coming to a 
a great standard of jiu-jitsu for you to roll against yeah possibly but i also talk about this as a lesson in my course is like how to make any trading partner a valuable asset mm -hmm. so like i've rolled with q -fight. I still had good rounds with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't hurt him. I didn't fuck him up. I didn't break his leg. Mm -hmm. I still had good rounds. Good, high technical pace. Mm -hmm. And I can get better from that. Yeah. Like people seem to think that just because people aren't your weight class or anything like that, you can't get good. There are certain discrepancies between people who are my weight and people who are 77 kilos and what they can get away with. Mm -hmm. um, but that also goes both ways. It's a, it's a continuum, right? The bigger and stronger you are, technically, the less good you are. Mm -hmm. technically because you don't have to get you don't have to do as much technical shit yeah typically the smaller and weaker you are the better you have to be technically because you can't get away with bench pressing people off you it's just yeah. not how it works so typically that's the the schematics of it so if i'm rolling with somebody who's 77 kilos they might be better than me technically but i can get away with a little bit more because of my weight class mm -hmm. i don't use any strength when i roll those people so i'm having a technique battle mm -hmm. That's going to be fucking so good for me when I come up against guys my size because, again, yeah. typically, they're not very technical. They're just big and strong. Yeah. I'm probably going to be bigger and stronger than 99% of the people I roll. Mm -hmm. So, it's not a factor for me. What mm -hmm. is the factor? The fact is technique. Yeah. I can learn that very, very well off people who are smaller weight class than me. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't really see it as being a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, can, I can relate to that as well because when I was doing um, fighting at one gym at Elite Fitness, they had like an MMA kind of like maybe once a fortnight even it wasn't mm -hmm. very often so i gave it a go and then there was actually chicks doing the class as well and when i'd train with my mates we were just fucking trying to hurt each other mm -hmm. but when you had to train with the girls i feel like i actually got better doing that because i didn't want to fucking hurt them you know it I down mean? a bit yeah you have to mind that, your manners and that did help me i think it learned that yeah so i can imagine that would definitely be a same thing for you. Yeah. yeah exact same thing i roll with the girls all the time yeah 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 cool and is there anything that you think that the Australian jiu-jitsu community is lacking that can be improved upon? Or is everything pretty much where it should be? It's pretty fucking good at the moment. Yeah. It's pretty fucking good. Like, we had a good representation at the ADCC Worlds. Mm -hmm. We had a person in each weight class, which I think is history for Australia, including both of the women's divisions. Okay. Usually, it's somebody from, like... Say, for instance, because it's Asia and Oceania, sometimes someone from Kazakhstan will get in, sometimes someone from Japan will get in. We had Australians in every division. Yeah, okay. It was really cool. I mean, the trials were in Blacktown, so like home court advantage, What say whatever you want, but there were some people from Kazakhstan and Japan and Switzerland and stuff like that that were there. Mm -hmm. They just got beaten. They got mm -hmm. beaten by Australian people, which yeah. is really cool. So, yeah, 66, 77, 88, 99, 99 plus, all had Aussies in it. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Jeremy Skinner. Kenta Iwamoto, I know that's not an Australian name, but he was, yeah. I think he was born here. I'm not sure. He lives in Japan, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Japanese guy. I think he's Aussie. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had Isaac Michelle, 88, Craig Jones, 99, me, 99 plus. And then we had, um, fuck me, Adele Foromino in the under 60s. And, oh, fuck, what's her name? Nikki. I don't remember her surname. Mm -hmm. Nikki from, um, this is trying to call me. Um, yeah, she was in the over 60s. So we had Australian representation and everything. It was yeah. cool. Yeah. It was cool. cool. So that kind of gives you an idea about how we're progressing through the sport. Yeah. And kind of gives you an idea of what's capable if we just keep fucking doing the same thing. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Do you need to take that? Nah, it's all good. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Um, I forgot to ask you before, did you use a bathroom at any point? Just let me know as well. It's all good. I, um, don't, have, I don't have the bladder of a child. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, Oh, yeah. So, I kind of mentioned this a bit on this podcast. Mm -hmm. I think I have. If I haven't, then I just haven't posted those uh, podcasts yet. But I think life's very important to learn, for starters, because earning is learning. Mm -hmm. And then to teach as a second thing. I think mm -hmm. both are just as important and you should always do both. Are you involved in much teaching on the side of jiu-jitsu yet? Yeah, so that's pretty much what my course is, um, taking people who are lesser experienced than me all the way up to the same experience level, hopefully in the same velocity of results. So obviously, like, not everybody's going to go from white to brown belt in 23 months, which is pretty fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, but people will be able to get faster gradings, better technique, um, better technical application of the stuff that they are learning, and they are going to be get, getting better, like, significantly faster, which is kind of what I'm trying to do at the moment. Yeah. Um, but involved in that, I do, like, Q&A and stuff where they ask me questions. I send them videos of techniques and all this sort of stuff. Um, but, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I am doing. Yeah, yeah, cool. That's good to know. 
Yeah. And when it comes, it sounds like you're pretty sufficient on looking after yourself. You mm-hmm. do your own courses and you're pretty much your own boss, mm-hmm. which kind of takes away from my question. My question was going to be, how can you try and monetize what you're doing in a way that you can provide for yourself in jiu-jitsu? But considering you're already doing that, what are some ways other people can try and turn jiu-jitsu into a career? Um, I don't even know how, if you get paid to do tournaments or anything. No, nah, you got to pay to do tournaments. Okay. Yeah, it's the other way around. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you sell your intellectual property. It's like anything else. It's like we're an attention-based economy. The more attention you can garner, the better your product is, the more it's going to sell itself. So mm-hmm. if that's your personality, if that's your technique, if that's the way that you put things together, if it's the way that you articulate things, anything like that, you can monetize anything these days. Mm-hmm. Um, people that are poor are fucking stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're either, you're either stupid, yeah. arrogant, or lazy. Yeah. Like there's the general nomenclature on the idea. Um, where people just whinge or they blame their circumstances. Or I, I have a story on this. Um, when I was growing up, didn't come from money, had to help parents pay bills, all this sort of shit. And um, I would always look at people like driving Porsches and stuff like that. I asked my mom, I was like, hey, why is that guy driving a Porsche? And she goes, oh, well, you know, some people are lucky, some people are drug dealers. Yeah. That was legitimately the response. <laughs> And I look back at that now, I'm like, what a fucking limited view of the world. Yeah. It's crazy. A Porsche isn't even that expensive. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think a base model Porsche was like 100 grand. Mm-hmm. Like, you get a loan for that. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, what if, that, doable, what yeah. if that guy was leasing it? Yeah. You know, what if it was a company car? What if it was any of these other things? What if, it, like, you didn't even, you didn't even reach the typical answer of that guy fucking earned it. Mm-hmm without going through several different options that weren't lucky or drug dealer. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was some yeah. substantial different bits and pieces in there. So it's interesting to me that people still think like that and they think that their circumstances dictate their lives and how successful they are. And that's that's sort of what they look towards. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also look to blame anything but themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's probably what keeps most people stuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> As a forward thinker, like you're letting me know you are, where do you see yourself in, say, 10 years from now within the jiu-jitsu sport or community? It's a good question. I don't really like even really setting goals, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. Um, if I would have set the goal to be a brown belt when I first started, I would have set the goal to do it in five years. Yeah. And I've done it in less than two. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a cool representation of the aforementioned glass ceiling. Yeah. If you set the goal to win, to make a hundred grand a year, you're only going to ever earn 80 to a hundred grand a year. Mm-hmm. If you set the goal to make a hundred grand a month, you might yeah. earn 80 to a hundred grand a month. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't necessarily think that it's like in concrete, um, but man, I, I don't think about outcomes really that much. I think about my commitments on a day-to-day basis. I think about training 13 times a week for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, wherever that takes me is wherever that takes me. Like yeah. I, I'm going to be really fucking good at the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, will I be a world champion? Sure. Mm. Like, yeah. It's kind of inevitable. Yeah. yeah. And, and what about on a sense where it's like, do you ever want to open your own gym or do you want to maybe start some kind of, thing within a sport outside of like competition wise? Um, I'm kind of doing that again with the course. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm against owning gyms in like two senses, like jujitsu and weight weightlifting. Um, it's always better to be the man who knows the guy who owns the yacht than be the guy who owns the yacht. Yeah, that's a great point. Because Fuck. you always wow. get to use it for the parties, but yeah. you don't have to pay the upkeep or the staff or anything like that. Fuck, like that makes sense. You know what I mean? So leasing and staff and- clientele and all this sort of stuff and having a physical location that you're tied to Mm -hmm. i don't really think is a good idea tactically obviously it has to exist for me to be as good at the sport as i am yeah um but would i ever personally do it no yeah so you appreciate it but you don't really you're not looking to be a part of it. it's one of the only reasons i'm here yeah um but would i do it no yeah okay cool fair enough i like the answer there's a um couple questions that i try and ask you that i haven't seen myself yeah sure i do this with everyone that comes on just towards the end of the episode. Yeah. I could I could keep talking to you, but I ha- actually have to go to work shortly. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so I do my favorite subject so is myself, and I can talk for hours. <laughs> yeah. And you're good at it. Yeah. You're good at it. I appreciate I, it. I have to say, I didn't expect this to be as um, interactive as a podcast as I thought mm. it would be, because I thought you'd just be focused on jujitsu, but you have a great mindset across life. I entirely. appreciate it. It's, it's one of those general um, colloquial things that the guy who's jacked as fuck is stupid, <laughs> and it's just not true. Yeah. Uh, actually, in my experience, it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who take care of themselves and lift weights and take care of their body and actually look into this sort of stuff yeah. are usually hyper-intelligent mm-hmm. on some level. Yeah, you get those dumb, roided-out dickheads. Mm-hmm. It happens. But yeah. you, get dumb, roided, uh, you get dumb, skinny fucks too. Yeah. You get dumb, fat fucks as yeah. well. So, yeah, that's just my point on that. Yeah, cool. 
All right, the first one is can the can this uh, can the phrase "just be yourself" ever be poor advice to someone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on who you're being. Yeah. If you're a sack of shit and you fucking smoke weed twice mm. a day, um, and all you do is eat shit food and play Xbox, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. don't be that guy. Yeah. Um, be your. Uh, it depends on how you take it, right? It could go a multifactorial of ways, but you should always be authentic to mm-hmm. who you are. But I don't think that necessarily is the activities that you choose to do. Yeah. If you don't have friends in your circle that are pulling you up for dog shit activities. You need to take a hard look at yourself in the mirror Mm -hmm. Um, because I can't do the work for you. Mm -hmm. No one can do the work for you. It has to be based off your own back. So just be who you are. I love it. But if you deep down know, actually, you know what? I'll take back my point. I'll say, no, it can't be good. Uh, It can't be bad advice. Okay. Because if you're going deep down and you know, like everybody knows that what I just described, the scenario is fucking stupid and you're going nowhere. Mm Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that. So yeah. if you are just being who you are, you deep down know that you're on the wrong path and yeah. you should fucking change it. Okay. I'll change my mind. Yeah, okay. Change my mind. I'll have to disagree with you. Okay. I reckon, Interesting. I reckon be yourself isn't necessarily a good advice in my opinion because I think the only way you can say it is be the best version of yourself because me, I think I am intrigued. Uh, I don't know the right word. I was going to say intrigued, intrinsically, but I don't think that's the word. Intrigued? Uh, or intrinsically. Intrinsically. Yeah, I intrinsically. Yeah, intrinsically. Say it. Yeah. I think I'm lazy deep down. I really do. I think deep down I'm lazy, and my absolute goal is to be doing nothing. But I know that in order to be able to do nothing for an extended period of time, I need to put in as much work as I can so I can be as stable and proud of everything I've done at the end. I've already you know told I mean? you this story, but you brushing your teeth for more than twenty years proves that you're not lazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but like, say when I might for me, I think. The end of old age is going to be the best part of my life because I'm going to be proud of everything I've done so far and mm-hmm. the journey has already been taken and I'm proud of that at the end. So I mm-hmm. think that's what I'm chasing towards. But that's not lazy. It's not lazy. That's not the definition of lazy. Definition of lazy would be wanting those things and putting off all the things you're doing right now. Okay. That would be my definition of lazy. Uh, yeah. I don't believe in laziness. Mm-hmm. I don't believe it. You wake up every day. It doesn't matter what time. Mm-hmm. You eat every day. You drink every day. You drink water. Mm-hmm. You go to work every single day, even when you don't want to. That's not lazy. Yeah, okay. You actually convinced me because if I was to be myself, it is still to be myself to be proud of the things I've accomplished. Exactly. Even though I want to be there in the end. Yep. All right. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> you, know, you, nice. you got me. Nice. All right. What would you say to your 22-year-old self that you didn't know then? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> okay, cool. Keep, I didn't expect to hear an answer, to be honest. Keep going, you fucking large cunt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 22 for me isn't that long ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was only three years ago for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't live in a world where I believe in regrets. I don't live in a world where I believe that anything that I have done has been a mistake. Mm-hmm. I've never made a mistake. Yeah. I've pushed myself in the right direction of where I needed to be, whether I knew it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the exact same. I think yeah. I, have no, I have no regrets, even for all the bad things I've done and the, mm-hmm. the sorrow that I've inflicted into other people as well. Necessary. But I think it made me who I am. And if I hadn't have done it, yet i probably would have still done it to someone in the future yeah so. i have a really good quote it's one of my favorites it's um what happened happened and it couldn't happen any other way why because it didn't yeah 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 okay, yeah perfect that's yeah. a perfect quote yeah can't be argued no all right what about faith over facts would you prefer facts or faith what if my faith is factual mm. well i don't know if faith can be factual in my opinion i think faith is a belief in something Mm-hmm. That isn't. It can't be measured. So you can't use statistic and analysis to get it. You have to just believe. What if my belief is that I will stick to everything that I say I'll do? Or my faith is that same sentence. I think that's faith. I don't know if that's facts. Even though you have the experience of going through it. But what if I follow that up with action to represent will- proof of my evidence of doing so? Yeah, I think that's how you will turn faith into facts. Can yeah. it not be both? Oh, it's kind of like the chicken. Hard, it's yeah. kind of like the chicken and the egg, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's do I believe the facts to construct my faith, or do I believe my faith to construct my facts? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I think it's kind of a moot point because it is both the same thing if you yeah. see it that way. Yeah. Um, I get the general idea of the question, whether it's like religion versus facts, or mm-hmm. or I believe this, and it's like, well, you have no evidence to prove that. Yeah. But if you do have evidence to prove it, that can be both. Yeah. Yeah. The way we're trying to answer it, I guess, is a way different question, and that's. It's yeah. more like a destiny kind of thing, like you know. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. All right. That's well, fair. we'll skip over that one then. 
Well, when was the time that you felt the most judged in your whole life? Mm. Good question. Dropping a ball uh, on a rugby league field in front of 40,000 people kind of fucking sucks balls. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't miss many tackles, but I definitely dropped a few balls. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard for me to answer because I don't really give a fuck mm-hmm. about what anybody else thinks because mm-hmm. it's my life and I'm the author. I got to write the story. Yeah. And if you wrote a novel right now of a guy who just sat in his room and thought about what everybody thinks about him, you'd be a very yeah. fucking boring story. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, probably that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's Probably a, that. That's, that's a, I think that's a feeling of almost facts at the end of the day. Mine's a bit more personal. It's like my, mm. my, I felt most judged, I think, doing public speaking in school. Yeah. Which now that I say out loud is pretty pretty weird to think about because I'm pretty comfortable speaking now. Mm-hmm. But that's because I'm putting in a bit of practice to get here. Mm-hmm. But even though I don't think I really was judged that hard, that's when I felt the most judged. I wasn't yeah. good at doing that. That's fair. Yeah. Were you Were you ever good at public speaking and shit? I was the most shy kid known to men. Yeah, I would not, believe, I would not guess that. Yeah. I, had, I had zero friends in year four and I moved schools because of it. Okay. Like super, super shy, um, hated confrontation, hated fucking public speaking, hated speaking to anybody really. Um, Probably as a result of my mum owning the canteen at the school that I was at, so mm-hmm. I could always run to mum. Mm-hmm. Like it was always that fucking safety blanket sort of thing. So I never, yeah. never developed those skills um, until I forced myself to. Yeah. And again, it's another testament of your upbringing and your conditioning and all the things in your early life. I believe almost have no onus on the way that you choose to act every single day, mm-hmm. given that you accept they are what they are. Mm-hmm. And you could take this many ways. I think therapy is a very useful tool. But I only think it brings light to the things that you probably already knew. Uh, And if you sit within that and don't act away from those things if they are unhelpful or with those things if they are helpful, then it's kind of fucking redundant, really. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of evidence to say that traumatic instances are the way that we live our lives today, and I do believe that. It's also how much power you give to them. Mm -hmm. You will set up a general idea of how you think about the world, but that's your own personal responsibility to accept ignore or act upon yeah because i guess you could you probably have got many things in the past in your own in everyone's personal lives that you could use that as a building block as to why you've made the decisions you've made heaps but you wouldn't even know you've done it you wouldn't even it's probably not even you're just trying to relate it to that yeah yeah you yeah can't and pick and choose what you want to build yourself on. again i said it earlier people reason why they can people reason why they can't i don't see how it's any different yeah yeah good answer i like that uh, we'll do a couple more of these Go and I'll hit you with my final question that I ask everyone. What is the difference between who you are and what you do? Do you see much difference? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, I am what I do. Yeah. <laughs> I am what I do on a continual basis every single day. And, and it's, it's true for everybody, right? Mm. If you, so you're not fat, you've committed to actions that have made you fat. Mm. right that is not who you are it is what you do yeah you're not lazy you've committed to actions that have proven to yourself that you are lazy it's not who you are it's what you do right it's, it's just one of those things where people start to label themselves as this thing and this is why i hate the conversation around uh like add and stuff like that okay i understand there are chemical manipulations in the brain that lead you to certain understandings right uh or certain um circumstances but Attention deficit disorder means you're not fucking paying attention to the thing that you don't want to pay attention to. It doesn't mean you're wrong. It doesn't mean you suck. It doesn't mean you have this overbearing diagnosis on your life that you can't change. It just means you're not interested in what they're teaching you at school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't fucking read Shakespeare. Yeah. I don't yeah. like it. Yeah. I don't have an interest in it. I couldn't care less. Mm-hmm. Do you think I pay attention? Yeah. No. Yeah. You sit me in front of a fucking jujitsu tape for three and a half hours and I don't blink. <laughs> yeah. This is the easiest way to destroy this fucking whole bullshit, right? Everybody says that young boys have problems paying attention at school. Sit them in front of Call of Duty or Mm -hmm. fucking Fortnite. Yeah. Eight hours straight. They won't even (laughs) eat shit or sleep or do anything. They have undivided attention and focus. Mm. What the fuck's the difference? Yeah, yeah. It's just not being interested. That's why I did DNA ADHD is to me. It's just not being interested. And that's why I'm very careful of labels and saying, I am this. No, Mm -hmm. it is what you're choosing to do which can be manipulated through action, which yeah. means you're the fucking author of your own story and you can change that whenever you want. Yeah. It's not who you are. You are not sad. You are not happy. You are not angry. You're feeling angry. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Feelings pass. They come and go like traffic. Mm-hmm. They go from this side to this side and then they're out of the brain. Yeah. Like how long are you actually vehemently angry for? Yeah. 30 seconds? Yeah. 
That doesn't mean you're an angry person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you exist as an angry person. It just means you were angry once. Yeah. Fuck, sue me. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, good. I like that answer. And just speaking on things like um, how ADD and ADHD might not necessarily be a disorder. Mm -hmm. In other countries, I know that they actually look at that part that people have as a child as a more of like a, a gift. You know Curiosity what I mean? thing. As opposed to what we shun upon it. And fuck, that yeah. was a great way to reference it against Call of Duty because yeah. every fucking person that I ever knew that was diagnosed with ADD or ADHD is a fucking pro gamer. Sit down and play Xbox for eight <laughs> hours straight without blinking. Yeah. yeah. How do you explain that? Yeah. All right, beautiful. Oh, here we, I hear you with one more of these. Go for it. What, in your opinion, does the world need less of? Mm. Lefties. <laughs> as like my non-serious answer blue head fucking people um what does the world need less of the world needs less acceptance and oh, okay. i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that i don't give a fuck if i get roasted for it mm -hmm. i don't care it needs less acceptance of situations if you are willing to sit there and accept your situation and say that it is this reason because i am this way you're a fucking idiot mm -hmm. Everybody ahead of you has earned that place. Mm. Now, look, you, there's a caveat. There's a rich kid who drives a Ferrari and says, you just need to work harder. Yeah, like, yeah. All right, there's always what, exceptions. All right, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But if you accept your circumstances for where they are, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. Any given set of circumstances, like let's use LeBron James for an example. Grew up in Akron, shittest fucking town in America, poor as fuck, couldn't even afford shoes, and now he's a billionaire. Mm-hmm. What the fuck's the difference between you and him? Yeah. Absolutely nothing, except he did not have acceptance for his circumstances. He goes, you know what? I think I deserve better than this. I'm going to work my ass off to get it. Mm -hmm. If I sat here and just coasted and accepted where I was right now, you wouldn't hear of me in two, three years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. not the plan. And I think being accepted for who you authentically are is a great thing. But I think if you know you should be better, fucking be better. Mm -hmm. Don't accept where you are. Mm -hmm. Don't accept the ability to say like, oh, yeah, I did some work maybe a year ago. Maybe I just, you know, mm -hmm. I'll just fucking float around. No, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. I, I think I think we actually had the same answer. Except that a different word popped into my head. The first thing I thought of was the world needs less excuses. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I thought. But I think it's the same synonymous. fundamental answer. Yeah, yeah. synonymous, I yeah. would say. Yeah, cool. Definitely. That's actually something I think about a lot. A lot of people just have excuses for... Just the way things are, things are. Yeah. But fuck, bro, I, do, I use it as fuel. I fucking love it when things are shit, eh? Yeah. <laughs> when things are shit, it makes me want to do better. Yeah, and this is the thing, man. Like, I didn't have a really nice childhood um, from my general perception of the idea. I was like fucking really angry kid, and I wanted to prove a lot of people wrong. Mm -hmm. And I still do mm -hmm. because I think ignoring that is ignoring a great source of fuel that gives me the ability to continue to do everything I do today. And I, mm. when I was a kid, I used to get bullied. I was a small er kid when I was like first growing up and then I started to get heaps bigger. Um, but I was a weird kid. I was fucking shy. I didn't talk to many people, kind of did my own thing. People picked on me, did whatever. How do you stop that? You become the biggest, ugliest, strongest cunt <laughs> on, that you can, yeah. right? Look where I'm fucking sitting right now. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't articulate that to myself at maybe the age of 19 and realize that it was actually a really good fuel source mm -hmm. that was driving me to do these sorts of things, I probably would have stopped. Yeah. I probably would have given up. Mm -hmm. Probably would have done something else. Probably would have gone, eh, it's kind of stupid that you're living out like a childhood, you know, mm -hmm. um, a, a childhood like sort a of vendetta. discrepancy. Yeah, e exactly right. And like, oh, would you really want to live your life in anger and that sort of stuff? If it fucking takes me to the top, yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, well, that's end. To be honest, I like the way you think, bro. I've got to ask you one more question. I know you don't like it when people say No, I, like I like it. No, I like these uh, questions, you're helping, you're helping me just get a better um, articulation to how I think I think as well. Yeah, of course. Because I think a lot of people listening, because I know the way my mates think, yeah. they'll be benefiting from it as well. Yeah, of course. Because that's what, that's what my listeners are, my, my, the boys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love the boys. I imagine it's it's my family and fucking three other people that <laughs> listen to my podcast too. Yeah. All right. One more of these then. Would you rather lose all your memories from birth to now or lose your ability to make new long-term memories? Mm -hmm. I've heard this question too. Ability to make new long-term memories or all my memories from birth? And let's say you obviously keep your like genetic memories, like you know, like you know how to eat and drink and shit and live, but you don't have what makes you you. I like the idea of being a blank slate and being able to write the story. Mm-hmm. I'd lose the ones from birth. 
Yeah. Because then I get to decide who I am. Yeah. I get to be reminded of who I am. Mm. And generally speaking, from a psychological perspective, I've done like a lot of psychological research and read a lot of books about it. People's idea of you is much more satisfactory than your own idea of you. Mm-hmm. So if you could never make new memories, you're kind of stuck and stagnant. Mm-hmm. If you are only at the whim of other people telling you what you were to them, yeah. kind of like if you died at a funeral, people yeah. will always bring out the best stories of you. It's like, oh, he's a funny guy, like he's dedicated, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting to me because a lot of people tell me what they think of me and they go, fuck, man, like I don't know how you do the stuff that you do. And if I was to delete all my memories now and just have that be the only living thought that I could build off of, mm-hmm. I think I'd be in a pretty good spot. Yeah, that's awesome. Because my favorite my favorite part of life and the thing that I'm always striving towards is the feeling of being proud. Mm-hmm. I think not pride as in like an ego, but mm-hmm. proud as in accomplishments and just the journey that I'm on. So mm-hmm. I think that if, and you're living your life and you feel like you'd have proud, you have pride in the person that you think other people are mm-hmm. accounting to you to be, which is cool. Yeah. I think an, an interesting caveat, I don't think ego is a bad thing whatsoever. I no. think I think people demonize it a lot, um, but they're literally the only reason I'm sitting here having achieved all the things I have is because I have a huge fucking ego. Yeah. I think yeah. I deserve more than the average person Yeah, and I'm willing to fucking work for it. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, see how that could be a that, problem. That can't be ego then. Do you think- It is though. Is it? when you? Because I think I deserve better. But, but then you have a so, reason for it. So if you're, you're arrogant, it. you won't work towards it. Okay. If you're egotistical, you will work towards it. Okay. I didn't know that's that. That's my general understanding or that's how I choose to see yeah, it yeah. rather. If you're saying I deserve more than you because I am who I am, mm. you're a fuckwit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I deserve more than you because I've earned the right to say that through violent action towards a task that I want to have achieved, mm-hmm. egotistical, sure, mm-hmm. but I fucking earned it. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. you can't take that away from me. Yeah. But I, I think that's yeah. the thing that drives people. Mm-hmm. I think everybody's an egomaniac. Like I talked about the people who are the most successful. Michael Jordan wouldn't let cunts beat him at cards. Yeah. Like yeah. full on flip out if someone beat him at cards. <laughs> yeah. Like I know, I know so many stories like that. Like I don't let guys at jiu-jitsu win drilling. Yeah. <laughs> I don't let them submit me even in drilling. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like that's yeah. the thing that's pushed. But like, I don't get scored on in gym. Mm-hmm. I do not get scored on in the gym. And apart from the Felipe Pena match at the world titles, mm-hmm. I haven't been scored on in over 47 matches. Wow. In a row. Wow. The last time I got scored at was I uh, scored on, sorry, was my first competition as a blue belt. Yeah, wow. Well. Almost like 18 months ago now. I, I skipped that entirely. I, was, I would have killed myself. If, I would have kicked myself if I didn't hear you just say now, but you're saying you did 47 competitions before you went to ADWC? Uh, I was 50. What was I? 58 and 2. Wow. That's going into ADCC. Lot. 80% sub rate. Never been subbed in comp. That's a fucking lot of yeah. fucking competition. Up until, frame. up until my last competition at um, fuck, what was the name of the competition? Oh, Juju Terrors. No, it wasn't Juju Terrors. What the fuck was it? It was in Sutherland, ADCC Nationals. Up until my last comp in ADCC, ADCC Nationals, not one person had hit a single offensive move on me in competition. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah. No one had even come close to step one of step five of a submission. Oh, wow. Like, not even close. <laughs> yeah. And the only time I've been close to being submitted was a calf slicer in which I heel hooked a national to- a multi-national time champion black belt. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. like, he put a sub on me, like, was close. Mm-hmm. Like, I could have tapped, but fuck him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I popped his leg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I'm, what am I now? I'm 63 and four. 63 and three. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the fuck I am. Anyway, it's mm-hmm. impressive. Yeah, that is a lot. I didn't expect it to be that many because I'm trying to yeah. relate it to like as if you were a fighter and 63 fights in court three years is absurd. Like that's yeah. a lot. That's yeah. fuck. I mean, jiu-jitsu is much less of a fight than it is a match. Yeah. Um, And there's much less dire physical consequences than there are in sparring and kickboxing and Muay Thai and stuff like that. There's no concussions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know you have a lot more risk in jiu-jitsu, like broken limbs or torn ligaments. Yeah, but you can tap. You can give up. Okay. Like in boxing, you can get back up or you can stay down, but you've already been knocked out. Yeah. And like in MMA, you get knocked down, you get the fuck beaten out of you. Yeah, it's over. Yeah, kind of like, you know, yeah. there's more dire physical consequences in MMA than there is in jiu-jitsu. Uh, yeah, sure, you can break an arm, you can break a leg, you can go to sleep. There's no physical consequences going to sleep. Um, but yeah, it's definitely more dangerous in MMA for sure. Is there many injuries inside of jiu-jitsu that, like, that happen regularly? Yeah, there's significantly less than people think. 
Um, would be a yeah, there's actually a lot more in rugby league than there is in jiu-jitsu. Okay. Even though we're applying specific joint locks. But the sheer fact that you can tap and get out mm. kind of leads the idea that it's like, you know, mm. you get to a point where you're no longer safe and you go, I, I give up. Yeah. yeah. It just happens. At the world stage, people let their legs break. They let their arms break. Oh, fuck yeah, they, they just let it break. Because they just can't bring themselves to tap it. Like, they they want to win. They think they can get out of it. They want to win. A uh, guy in the 88 kilo division, Wagner Ocha, came third at ADCC. Uh, Owen O'Flanagan, really good guy, breakout year, 88 kilos. Uh, broke the fuck out of his leg, like completely ruined this guy's leg. Didn't tap, ended up winning the match. I think he scored on points uh, and then was walking around the rest of the weekend on crutches with a, go- with a oh, bronze so medal. He, his leg got broken and he continued to roll and he won. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. That's oh, tough fuck. motherfuckers. That is fucking gangster. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, there's some tough motherfuckers in the sport. Like, I, I've taken a couple pops in training and not tapped, mm-hmm. and it's just like, oh, my foot hurts for another two days. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. And is an injury like that, like a broken leg or a broken arm, or I've had a knee reconstruction, so mm-hmm. I'm asking from a question of myself, but are you more uh, prone to getting more injuries regularly if you already have a a broken yeah probably if you fuck the rehab up but i broke my ankle and now it's fused and it's got bolts and shit in it so have fun popping that yeah that's the same with my knee i always get paranoid thinking about doing something like jiu-jitsu in case it gets fucking popped the wrong way maybe yeah well we have a lot of guys with like torn meniscus and stuff like that and then that yeah their their knee comes out or it catches or something like that um yeah baby dave one of our students his shoulder dislocates all the time but he still goes yeah still rolls yeah Yeah, still rolls i mean it's not life changing yeah yeah, well i mean i fucking dislocated my finger two weeks ago and it's still like yeah that looks fucked yeah i can't fully i can't fully straighten it (laughs) that's kind of fucked yeah but um if it takes time off training i'm not doing it yeah 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 that's dedication i'm like i'm here to get better i'm not here to worry about one finger yeah I'll get rid of the cunt if I have to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> fucking wild. Yeah. That's wild. Honestly, I could yarn with you. I could keep yarning with you, but I say this at the end of a most successful episode. I feel like we can do a part two at some point in the Absolutely. future. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to come do part two. Yeah, beautiful. So I have to have you with my final question that I do ask everyone, mm-hmm. and that's what's some advice that you would give to someone who just feels a bit depressed because they're feeling lost? Fuck, listen to the last two hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What's some advice I give to people who are depressed? If you work on improving every single measurable metric of your life and just continue to march forward and start to become competent at things and start to become better at anything, I don't give a fuck if it's playing eight ball pool on your phone. I don't care if it's ping pong. I don't care if it's cooking meals. It doesn't matter. Get better at something. Mm. There's... I fail to see how people can't pull themselves out of any situation, including depression. Mm -hmm. I was clinically diagnosed as depressed um, January this Mm -hmm. year amidst Mm -hmm. all this crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I refuse to believe it. Okay. So I went to a psychologist. um, Long story short, uh, a missus of five years broke up with me in um, February or whatever it was. Oh, actually, so it would have been March that I would have been diagnosed. Anyway, it's not the point. Mm-hmm. Um, went through a fucking tough time. Breakups are shit. Yeah, breakups sucks. Are fuck shit, yeah. um, had like the biggest competition in my life coming up and had a lot of these things in the air and like I had to figure out if I was going to move houses or not and all that sort of shit going on. Uh, and then, yeah, a therapist told me, she's like, yeah, you fucking sound depressed. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. What do I do with this information? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I just chose not to apply it to my life. Yeah. I went, I didn't say like I wasn't. I just went, well, I've got shit to do anyway, so mm-hmm. I may as well keep doing the shit that I meant to do. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm in a completely fucking different place. Mm-hmm. Did I think about how depressed I was? No, not mm-hmm. really. Did I did I allow it to stop me from getting better at what I wanted to do? No, mm-hmm. not really. So it's not a necessary thing of like, oh, I don't believe in it or anything like that. It's just like, well, if you improve some measurable metric of your life and you continue to get better in that space and you allow that to take up the majority of your time, I don't think you have the ability to actually sit there and go, fuck, I'm sad. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, how do I be the opposite of sad? Mm -hmm. You you know what you're doing to be depressed. You might not be doing what you say and saying what you do. You might be reneging on um, engagements and stuff like that. Like you tell the boys you're going to meet them on Friday night and then you pull out real late. Mm -hmm. Or you say you're going to study and then you don't do it. Or you say you're going to put in more effort at work and don't do it. What about if you started doing those things? What if you started if you put effort in towards those things? And what if you started doing the things that you said you were going to do? Well, that would be the opposite of depressed, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, so now I know the blueprint. I know the formula. Mm. Why don't I just do that? 
Yeah. And it's not this big disastrous thing. And again, it goes back to the same thing. That's why I said, listen, the last two hours, yeah. you are not depressed. You are feeling depressed. There is a huge yeah. fucking difference. difference yeah. If you feel something, I can feel hungry. Doesn't mean I am hungry, yeah. right? Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. So I think, yeah, if you, if you took anything out of this, like that's some pretty good advice, but fuck, listen to the last two hours and then put yeah. it together. Yeah. It's a great piece of advice. A great piece of advice. The reason I ask is because I feel like everyone knows what they need to do in order to get out of that situation, especially when you're feeling depressed because you're feeling lost. Yeah. Everyone knows the, the blueprint, as you're saying, you know, yeah. healthy diet and exercise, finding goals, um, just striving at your goals. But sometimes I think the right the right sentencing is important for some people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I like I like the sentencing that you use. It was a good analogy. Oh, man, look, uh, half the shit I say is going to piss people off. Half the shit I say is going to inspire people. But if you don't risk inspiring people, you never risk people. Uh, if you don't risk pissing people off, you'll never risk inspiring people. So fuck yeah. the cunts I piss off. I fuck yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't care less. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, I do really appreciate you coming over. Thank you for giving me the, your time today. Hey, my pleasure. And I'll, um, I'll send you a link to this when it's all done. Unreal. Yeah. And boys that are all listening, thank you for making it to the end of the episode. Yeah. I'll join you for part two. Easy.